Belinda and Harper Collins present this unabridged recording of A Stranger in the Family, Maeve Kerrigan, Book 11, written by Jane Casey and read by Caroline Lennon. Dedication For Julia Wisdom, with love. I have an habitual feeling of my real life having passed and that I am leading a posthumous existence. John Keats's last letter, 30th of November, 1820. 1. Did you notice anything out of the ordinary? Afterwards, when the whole horror of it had been laid out and their innocence, or rather, the degree to which they should feel guilty, had been debated by people who knew them, and many more who didn't, it was the small, uneasy details that lingered in the mind. What went missing with her, and what did not? What happened during the holiday, a month earlier? The argument, two days before? The car with a broken number plate, and how many times it was seen near the house? the tiny bare bedroom with blood on the floor, the visitors to the house that week, the letters before, the phone call after, the open door, the river, the bruises and scrapes, the way her brothers reacted or did not, the things they said or did not, the way her father cried, her mother, her mother her mother. But most of all, how long it was before anyone realised she was gone. 2. For some time now, Helena Marshall had been waking up every morning in a panic. It was instant. A punch of fear that struck before she was even aware that the day had begun. Today was no different. She peeled off her eye mask and blinked at the ceiling, at the light shade that probably needed dusting, and a smudge that had once been a mosquito in the corner, and the crack that wandered across the plaster, and a cobweb. The house was full of spiders because August was when they started preparing for cold weather, and it was an old house with sash windows that were loose in their frames and gaps in the floorboards and fireplaces in bedrooms, and the chimneys needed sweeping, now that she came to think about it. But the sweep had been so rude the last time he came. There was a notebook by her bed, with a pen, and she could start a list of jobs to do. Dust shade, remove cobweb, find new sweep. But it was so boring. And no one else noticed these things or did anything about them. It was always her job to sort out the house. And the children, and remember to buy school shoes. School shoes, that needed to go on the list that she wasn't making. And actually, she had better ways to spend her time. Work that needed to be done. Beside her, her husband gave a long, quavering snore. If she was a man, no one would expect her to bother about the chimneys being swept and the gutters cleared, which they would need to be. There were thriving miniature rainforests in three or four places, and August had been so wet, and the brickwork would take any excuse to soak up damp, and present it to her in bouquets of dull grey blooms on the wallpaper. It was, she checked, peering in the half-light, ten minutes past six. The sun had risen, in theory, but it was a dull day, and the forecast was for rain again, and that didn't help her mood. Her age, Dr. Fuller said. Her age seemed to be the answer to every question she asked the doctor these days. The aches in her joints. The skittish unreliability of her memory. The way her skin looked in the morning, and the evening and after a glass of wine. 
the sense of impending doom. There was no other reason for it. Her life was busy and fulfilling. She didn't like seeing the changes that time was making to her famously lovely face, but that was what happened. Count your blessings. Lying there, Helena tried. She was getting things done when it came to her work, and that was good, even if it meant unpleasantness from ignorant people. Her husband was rich, reasonably nice, supportive of her, and present, unlike several of her friends' husbands who had slid away to new lives where they could pretend to be young again. Bruce was 13 years older than her, which made him 59. And she would have to plan a party for his 60th. That was another job that would take up time she didn't have. They had met later than their contemporaries, married within six months. And he had already been fading into comfortable middle age. She had been a minor star, famous enough to have her picture in the paper, often coming out of nightclubs or at the races. A sort of celebrity, on the guest list for parties and launches, even if no one quite knew why. She had thought he was wonderful, and he had thought she was beautiful, and that had seemed like enough. Then marriage, and motherhood, which was another life. Helena was not the sort of person to run away from things, but she sometimes dreamed of packing a bag and going away for a week or a month, meeting a stranger, having a wild affair, and only coming back to the cobwebs and the drafts and the homework and muddy sports kit and maddening questions when she was good and ready. And that was why she hadn't overreacted on holidays. That was why Bruce still snored beside her. Helena wriggled her shoulder blades flat against the mattress to try to relieve the ache at the base of her neck. The boys should have come first on her list of blessings, probably. Ivo was fourteen, and overnight had gone from sweet-natured compliance to frowning silence. He only seemed happy when he was playing some sort of sport, which, at least, he was good at. Magnus was twelve, and, a squirm of genuine anxiety at this, insufficiently focused on his schoolwork. He was lazy and not bright enough to get away with it. His school report had made it impossible to ignore the issue, along with the phone call from his head teacher, suggesting that if things didn't improve, he might be happier at a different school. So they were paying, at vast expense, for a tutor to come all summer. And Rosalie, of course. They had Rosalie, who was nine. Rosalie's room was the smallest, and it needed a new carpet, thanks to her experiments with making perfume out of pilfered cosmetics and household cleaning products. Helena had been thin-lipped about it, and Bruce had laughed. Rosalie was a willful child, demanding in a way that the boys had never been. Girls were different, she'd been warned. Helena kept her preferences strictly to herself, but if she had to choose, in a fire, say, she would rescue her boys first, and, of them, Magnus had her heart, but that was something she thought no one else knew. Ivo was a good boy, but Magnus had charm. And then she would go back for Rosalie, assuming she hadn't started the fire in the first place. What Helena often asked herself was whether Rosalie was disturbed or just too bright for her own good. She was intelligent, interested in everything a sponge for facts, prone to awkward questions and doggedly focused about them. She had never been playful. Helena had thought it would come in time and had been wrong. She took several deep, slow breaths 
focusing on the positives. They were as happy as most people could expect to be. Enough wallowing. She levered herself out of bed, braved the bathroom, chilly, and the bathroom mirror, unflattering, and pulled on a dressing gown. Now that she was upright, her anxiety had translated itself into energy. It was Friday, but they were at the tail end of the summer holidays. It would be hours before anyone else woke. On a whim, Helena went upstairs instead of down. The ceilings were lower up here, but there were two large bedrooms and a bathroom that made their Bulgarian cleaning lady shake her head. The important thing was that the boys occasionally showered in it. She missed the soapy clean smell that they'd had throughout their childhoods. Now a waft of sweat and muskiness and socks greeted her when she opened Ivo's door, like the men's locker room in a gym. He was face down, his head turned to one side, his arms and legs trailing off the bed. A spasm of tenderness made Helena tweak the duvet into place to cover his enormous calloused feet so he didn't get cold. His room was neat. Ivo was an organized child and always had been. Magnus's room next. It was wildly untidy. No chance of reaching the bed here, Helena registered, eyeing the floor. It was covered in clothes and miscellaneous crap that she wasn't allowed to throw out. Her favourite child was rolled up in the duvet like a sleeping gerbil. A tuft of his silky fair hair was just visible. Was he breathing? Could he have died in the night? Was that the reason for the feeling of doom that had been shadowing her since she woke up? Helena stared at the ball of duvet, which didn't move. She was a new mother again, terrified of cot death. Surely it should rise and fall. Surely... Magnus shifted, and a low fart vibrated through the mattress. The porcelain delicate newborn was long gone. She retreated, closing his door. It was a long time since she had checked on the boys while they slept, and she wondered if it would ever happen again, which was depressing. What was it they said? Long days, short years. She shivered as she hobbled down the stairs, trying to be quiet, thinking about the opinion piece she was writing for the Telegraph, and whether it was too angry and might put people off. Tone was so important. Not for a moment did she hesitate on the first floor. Not for a second did she consider going to check on Rosalie. Afterwards, she would struggle to explain that. But the last thing Helena wanted was company while she was writing. And specifically Rosalie, who would want to know what she was doing and why. No matter what Helena said, she would linger in the room like a black-eyed ghost. Helena wandered into her study and turned her computer on, shuffling through her notes, already half-absorbed. Back out of the study, into the sitting room, her nose wrinkling at the mess of squashed cushions on the sofa, and a stale smell. She tidied the room briskly, shuffling papers, plumping cushions, mouthing good lines to herself as she went. The supreme act of love, as a mother, is to give up a child to someone who can offer them more. Love isn't about blood, but care, kindness, and guidance. Too early for post, which was something of a relief, given the sort of messages she'd been getting since the last time she was on Woman's Hour. But she couldn't allow herself to be intimidated into silence. She went down the steps to the kitchen at the back of the house, 
and filled the kettle. All of this mattered. That was the problem. Life and death, literally. Wishing things were different wouldn't help, and in the meantime, children were suffering. The best place for a child to be, Eleanor thought, was with a loving family. Producing a child didn't make you a mother, and... A thin line of pale light ran down the edge of the back door. It wasn't properly closed. Helena had gone to bed before the boys and her husband. So one of them must have left it open, she thought, and strode across the kitchen, her slippers scuffing the floor in a way that would have the forensics officers shaking their heads a few hours later. The handle felt sticky as she shut the door. She sighed and went to the sink for bleach cleaner and a cloth. There was dirt on the paintwork, something dark, so she wiped it vigorously until it was spotless. The key wasn't in the lock or hanging on the hook where it lived, and Helena sighed again and went to make her tea. And she never, for one minute, thought that there was anything to worry about because she had been in practically every room of the house, and nothing was missing. 3. The Toyota Land Cruiser bumped up the track, the four-wheel drive barely coping with the heavy rutted mud and large stones on the only access road to Windholt House. Heavy gates topped with barbed wire blocked the track every mile or so, with signs warning that this was private property. The fields on either side of the road were muddy and straggled with unkempt grass, since the sheep no longer cropped it. Their absence had left the land without a purpose, without life. The rain had been constant for days. The third gate sat in a giant puddle that made the driver swear as he splashed through it, dragged the gate open, drove through, stopped, got out again, and swung the gate closed. Easier with a passenger, he thought, and winced at that thought, too. This wasn't a journey he made often. Today was different. Today was an emergency. Tearing anxiety tightened his hands on the wheel and turned his stomach into a sea of acid. The letter was where he had flung it on the passenger seat. It had been waiting in the P.O. box he visited once a week. An innocent-looking white envelope with his name in familiar handwriting. I don't know when you will read this, but you will be too late. He stopped at the last gate. The rain seemed to gather force as he got out of the car, drumming on his head and shoulders. Now that he was nearly at the house, he was afraid of what he would find, and more afraid of what he might not find. At first glance, everything at the house looked as it should. The Land Rover was parked near the front door. A light in the hall made the windows glow softly. He hurried around the side of the house, the wind catching the breath from his body as he faced into it. In the yard, the kennel was empty, but that meant nothing. The dog, a sheepdog, had died before Christmas. He hurried forward, stepping on something that gave under his foot with unpleasant softness. It was saturated with mud, but he held it up and shook it out. A jumper, hand-knitted, the colour impossible to guess, Pearl pink buttons at the neck. He gave a low moan and looked ahead to the back door. It was standing open. He hurried through to the hall, leaving a trail of prints from his boots, careless now as he flung open doors. Empty rooms. He ran up the stairs, praying under his breath. How could he have left her here? How could he have done anything else? 
The brass doorknob chilled his palm as he turned it, and he swung the door open on a nightmare. Four. Are you sure you don't mind? Ivo Marshall's voice was barely audible. The other man had to strain to hear him over the sound of the television from the room next to them. Racing commentary echoed through the flat, rapid and toneless. Of course I don't. It's not a burden for me to spend time with them. Not after so long. I'd have thought it would be worse, seeing them like this. Time takes its toll on us all. He held up his stick. I'm not what I was either. Ivo smiled. You haven't changed, Mr. Hood. Dennis, please. And I've slowed down a lot since Lydia died. He reached out and patted the younger man's sleeve. Take a weekend off, Ivo. Spend some time with your wife. I can help out with your parents, if that frighteningly effective young woman needs any assistance. Sabby her. Ivo looked around as if the carer was going to materialize behind him even though she wasn't due to arrive for an hour. She's brilliant, isn't she? I'm tempted to steal her when I go. It can't be long now until I need someone to look after me. Please, don't lure her to Bristol. We couldn't manage without her. Hood blinked. I was only joking, Ivo. I can see it's been difficult. Your mother... It must be a shock for you to see her how she is now. Helena was so beautiful, you know. So vibrant. I remember, Ivo said flatly. But she hasn't been like that for a long time. No, of course not. Hood tried to smile. My poor Lydia would be so sad to see her like this. Was it... Was it a stroke? Is there any hope of improvement? She has permanent brain damage because she tried to kill herself, and that didn't work out. So, no, there's no chance of her getting any better. A hint of impatience had crept into Ivo's voice, and he regretted it instantly as the older man drew back, alarmed. But she doesn't seem to be unhappy, exactly. It's worse for Dad. At least they're still together. In sickness and in health, Dad meant it. I was the same with Lydia. I'd have done anything for her. But I had no idea about your mother. Hood folded his hands on the top of his stick, a slight tremor running through him. We left Richmond before all of this happened. I remember. You were our favorite neighbors. Ivo's eyes were unfocused for a second. I remember waving goodbye when you drove off. All five of us together, before Rosalie disappeared. Awful. Hood said it with true sympathy. Unimaginable. None of us could have known. No, of course not. And Lydia and I didn't realize, you know, we thought, ah, oh, well, with hindsight, we should have kept in touch. He rallied. But I promise you, it's a pleasure to me to see your parents and to give you a bit of a break. I need it. Ivo ran a hand over his head and blinked, looking exhausted. I'll be away for the night on Saturday, but I won't be far from London if you need me. Magnus doesn't help out? Hood asked the question diffidently, almost as if he feared the question was in bad taste. No. A quick, tight smile from Ivo. This isn't Magnus's kind of thing. And you don't find it too much of a burden? It's not as if I have a choice. Uh, oh, Hood moved back, 
alarmed by the look on Ivo's face. It was a stupid thing to say. No, no, sorry, I shouldn't have snapped. Dennis? The television had gone silent, without either of them noticing. Bruce Marshall's voice was still strong. Are you there? Yes, I'm just coming. Ivo winced. Are you sure, Dennis? I can come back tomorrow. I'm used to it. Don't be silly. Hood moved to the door of the flat sitting room, deft in spite of his limp. You go and relax. Don't worry about anything. I'll do whatever needs to be done. You can count on me. Ivo followed him into the sitting room, where his parents sat in armchairs on either side of a fireplace that didn't work, staring at a big, old-fashioned television. Horses galloped towards the camera in a foreshortened blur. The colour contrast was turned up, so the grass of the race course was luminous green. Dad, I'm going now. Dennis is going to be here over the weekend, so if you need anything, he can sort it out for you. You aren't coming. Ivo stopped, caught Dennis Hood's eye, and said more firmly than usual, No, not unless you need me. Hmm. Bruce laced his hands over his stomach, staring unhappily across at the slumped figure of his wife. Her eyes were vacant, and her mouth hung open. Grey hair straggled over her shoulders. Dennis Hood looked away from her, uncomfortable. Ivo bent and kissed his father's cheek. But if you do need me, I'll be here, I promise. Let him go, Bruce. Dennis sat down in the chair beside his friend and patted his arm. We have plenty of catching up to do. Sabiha will make dinner and put mum to bed, Ivo reminded his father, pulling his jacket on. And Dennis said he'd be back tomorrow. All day, Hood confirmed. And Sunday, there's golf to watch. Ah, good. Bruce nodded and raised a hand in blessing. You go, Ivo. I'll see you in a couple of days. It will be nice to catch up with Dennis. Ivo bent over his mother, dropping a kiss near her forehead, without actually making contact with her skin. As he left the room, Dennis Hood leaned over conspiratorially. Do you remember Sammy Moguel? Bruce clapped his hands and crowed. Do I? How could I forget her? Neither of them heard the front door close. And if Helena was aware of it, she made no sign. Five. I knew exactly where I was going as soon as I heard the address. A flat in a mansion block in Battersea, overlooking the park. I took down the details automatically, scrawling them in my notebook, distracted. I'd lived in Battersea once, and I'd been happy. In ordinary circumstances, I would have been focused on the case, not where it was. Today's job seemed straightforward, though. Tragic, but not complicated. As I drove, I found myself on familiar streets, passing places I hadn't been for a long time. And I thought about the past, instead of what was coming my way. The address was on Prince of Wales Drive. I found a space and got out of the car, but instead of heading straight for the scene, I stood still. The air was clear and earthy, and in the distance, waterfowl honked in a minor key. Bare branches stretched over the railings, reaching towards the road, and the red brick mansion blocks that ran down the other side, symmetrical and magnificent, layered with white painted brickwork, 
so they looked like elaborate cakes. They hummed of privilege and wealth, and the finest Victorian building. And they would probably last twice as long again as the glass and metal high-rise flats that were springing up around the sturdy white chimneys of the old power station. I had parked near one of the park gates. On a whim, I slipped through it and fell back through time. Nothing had changed. There was the lake, where ducks were squabbling over food thrown by two earnest small children in hand-knitted jumpers, their mother bending over them. And there was a dog walker, managing a brace of mismatched hounds. And there, as ever, pairs of earnest ladies of a certain age, deep in conversation. I kept up a brisk pace, and it was barely a detour but I was lost in my memories for a self-indulgent minute or two. Until one of the less happy memories from that time resurfaced. A man who had watched me when I was in that very park, with every intention of causing me harm. A prickle of unease made me stop to scan the path behind me. I saw nothing except trees, a few joggers, and a couple walking hand in hand. The sense of danger lingered, though, and I was happy to leave at the next gate, focusing my attention on the job instead of myself. I had run laps of this park hundreds of times, and I had read the papers on lazy winter afternoons in nearby pubs, and I had kissed my boyfriend by the river, and I had wondered about the people who lived in the mansion blocks. Now it was time to think about how they died. I walked through the gate, and a hand closed around my elbow. Christ! I yanked myself free before I thought about it, and my free-floating anxiety found a focus in the man who was smirking at me. No, only me. Panic receded, replaced by irritation, but also wariness. D.I. Josh Derwent had a troublemaking glint in his eye. What are you doing? Were you watching me? I was waiting for you to finish your nature walk and get on with some work, if it's not too much trouble. All I did was walk through the park instead of outside it, I began, hearing the note of apology in my voice and hating it. It was always the same, me on the defensive, Derwent self-assured and assertive. I know. Derwent tilted his head to consider me, and I took the opportunity to look at him too. Something about him was different, but I couldn't pin it down. As usual, his suit was immaculate, his hair neat, his expression coolly amused by some joke he wasn't sharing. He looked thinner and I wondered if he was training for a marathon, or if there was some other reason for it. What he made of me, I couldn't guess. You didn't look as if you were enjoying yourself, he said at last. I felt as if someone was staring at me, so that ruined it, I said accusingly. Like before. His thoughts had been running along the same lines as mine then. I didn't think you'd remember that. It was a long time ago. I remember. You know, given that you have so much experience of being in danger, you could do with looking around you occasionally, paying attention to that little voice in your head. I looked back. I know. I folded my arms. Well, maybe if you hadn't been lurking here, I wouldn't have felt as if I was under surveillance. Most people would just say hello. I'm not most people. He leaned closer, his voice low. You know what I am. The words spun through my mind. Friend, landlord, colleague, bad boy, worst nightmare, almost lover. 
and stopped on the right one. My boss. Exactly, he grinned. So, do you want to visit the scene or just skip it and go for a stroll? If anyone's holding things up, it's you. I slid past him. Let's go. He was smiling to himself as we walked towards Leinster Mansions. It was halfway along the road, a fine six-storey edifice, with a gathering of police vehicles and uniformed officers and forensic service vans in front of it. Outside the police tape stood a small cluster of gawkers, who seemed typical of the local community. Genteel elderly people with small dogs, ultra-fit runners, and a couple of men who might possibly have been drug dealers and would definitely have known where to score if you needed to. I ducked under the tape, showed my credentials to the officer who was on scene guard, and ran up the stairs to the second floor, aware of Derwent on my heels. The front door to the flat was open, revealing a narrow, dark hallway with a wheelchair folded against one wall. I stuck my head in and looked to the left, where there was the promise of daylight. A couple of paper-suited sockers were deep in conversation halfway along the hall. I recognised Kev Cox immediately. He was a bald, middle-aged man, good-natured and hard-working, a brilliant crime scene manager. Can we come in? Kev looked around and beamed. Maeve, I heard you were on your way. Just watch where you step. We're waiting for Dr. Early. What's the story? Derwent asked from over my shoulder. The main area of interest is at the end, in the master bedroom, Kev said. Working back from there, off this hallway, you have another bedroom, then a bathroom, then the kitchen, and last but not least, the living room. It's quite a big place. Swanky location. He pulled a face. A bit stuffy for me. We've already been told off for making too much noise on the balcony outside the living room. What were you doing? I asked. Don't cry for me, Argentina. He was one of the only people I'd ever met whose eyes actually twinkled when he laughed. You know I'm famous for my Evita impression. And you look so like her, Derwin said. Hilarious. Kev nodded towards the living room. Your colleague is in there. I walked on the footplates that were laid down like stepping stones and made it to the first open door, where, with a flash of pleasure, I found Detective Constable Liv Bowen. She had been back from maternity leave for three months, and every day I thanked my stars that she'd returned. She was standing by a large window that overlooked the park, her attention focused on her phone. I took a moment to consider the old-fashioned decor, the walls peach and the carpet dark green, the furniture overstuffed and the curtains fussy. A narrow balcony ran along outside the windows. I was really looking for clues to the character of the people who lived there, but found very little. No books, a large and dated television, a couple of bland paintings on the walls. Through an archway, there was a formal dining room with a long mahogany table that was polished but empty and slightly too big for the space it occupied. A painting leaned against the wall, face in. A medicine container marked with days of the week lay on the table, and a stick hung on the back of one chair. There was a single framed photograph on a low table, a family picture from a holiday somewhere hot. They were sitting around a table under a tree, caught in a sun-dappled moment. Two boys, one hunched and awkward, one sprawling in teenage lankiness, a little girl with dark hair who was staring at the camera wide-eyed, the father with his mouth open as if he was talking, and the mother turning her head to one side, inscrutable behind huge dark glasses, her hair sleek and fair. 
What have we got? Derwent asked. Oh, uh, sorry. Liv shoved her phone in her pocket. Is everything okay? I moved towards her, concerned. Sonny's childminder thinks he might be coming down with something, because he didn't eat much breakfast. I can't bear it if he gets sick again, Maeve. He's been snotty ever since he started going to her. <laughs> That's normal, isn't it? Being around other kids, sharing germs, it's good for him. It's not good for me. I need sleep. She had shadows under her eyes. That's the first thing to go when he's sick, and I'm always the one who gets up to deal with him. Joanne seems to be able to sleep through anything. Annoying, I said sympathetically, while wondering how soon I could ask her about the case without being uncaring. Joanne says I'm trying to do too much. Does she? And what exactly was Joanne doing, if Liv was running herself ragged with childcare and work? Derwent cleared his throat. Uh, this is fascinating, but what I wanted was to hear about the murder, if at all possible. Two bodies, a husband and wife. He killed her and then himself, Liv said. Their carer found them this morning in their bedroom. I shivered. I hate these cases. So bleak. There's always a sad story behind it. And not really a crime. Liv amended her statement before Derwent could jump on it. Nothing to investigate, I mean. You seem very confident that you know what happened. Derwent folded his arms. Have you even seen the bodies? It looks very straightforward, honestly. A faint flush of colour warmed Liv's cheeks. Kev said there were two bedrooms. Did they live on their own? I asked quickly. They had a carer who came every morning and evening to cook and clean. She helped them get up and go to bed, but otherwise it was just the two of them. The second bedroom isn't really usable as a bedroom. Why not? It's full of archive boxes, piled up to the ceiling, practically. The only space left is for a desk. They'll be worth a look, Derwent said. That's the sort of thing you can do, Liv. She looked startled. There's hundreds of them, though. Then you'd better get on with it, as soon as Kev gives you permission. Why? I asked. What makes you think it's important? I don't know if it'll give us a reason for why they died, but at the very least it should be interesting. Derwent looked past me to live. Didn't anything else occur to either of you about them? What about their names? I flipped my notebook open and read them again. Bruce and Helena Marshall. As I said it, the name sounded familiar. N not the couple whose daughter disappeared twenty years ago. The very same, Derwent said, with some satisfaction. The name rang a bell, and I recognised the family in the photograph over there. It was actually sixteen years ago this summer. I'm betting the boxes in the spare room are to do with the investigation. It's coming back to me, Liv clicked her fingers. People thought they did something to her. And Helena was the one they blamed, but I don't recall why, I said slowly. Worth finding out, wouldn't you say? Derwent was at his silkiest, in case someone decided blaming them wasn't enough. Six. What are we waiting for? We had been in the flat for ten minutes at the most, but Derwent was pacing up and down like a caged wolf, snapping with impatience. Delays brought out the worst in him, and his best wasn't all that great. Dr. Early, I said, as Kev told you. Doctor, sorry I'm late. He turned to live. If the bedroom is out of bounds, why are we okay to stay in here and touch things? The bedroom is the only place that wasn't forensically compromised. I was the first one here, after the response officers. 
so I saw it before Kev got here. And you're allowed in here because he cleared this room already. Liv looked around. There wasn't much to check, he said, thanks to the carer. Sabiha Qureshi. She was in here first thing. Where is she? Can we talk to her? She had to go to her next clients. The agency couldn't provide cover for her. But we can talk to her later, Liv said quickly, as Derwent's face darkened. And I did run through the timeline with her. So, uh, what time did Sabiha leave last night? I asked. Seven. She came back at a quarter to eight this morning and let herself in, which was normal. She had a key. She was a bit surprised Bruce wasn't up already. He was usually having his breakfast when she got in. She just assumed he was resting and left them to sleep for a few minutes while she did some household jobs. Including cleaning. It smells of furniture polish in here. Yep, Liv pulled a face. I've never seen Kev so upset. Sabiha cleaned the kitchen and bathroom as well as in here. For God's sake, Derwent said. Why couldn't she have been lazy? No fingerprints, no DNA. Same as when the daughter disappeared, if I remember correctly. I had been taking notes. Did Sabiha usually put them to bed by seven? That seems early. How old were they? Bruce was 75, and Helena was 62, but she was the one who needed support. The carer put her to bed every evening, and last night was no exception. Bruce didn't always go to bed at the same time as Helena, but he didn't like watching television in here without her. He would go into the second bedroom and do some reading or writing if he didn't want to go to bed. He always got up by himself, quite early. Helena stayed in bed until Sabiha came in the mornings. What did she say about today? The short version? The flat was tidy, but she gave it a once-over before knocking on the bedroom door. She didn't know anything was wrong until she went in. No sign of a break-in, Derwent checked, and Liv shook her head. Was there a note? I asked. No. You'd think Bruce would have left something on the door. Derwent was looking thoughtful. Dear Sabiha, don't come in. Call the police. Love Bruce. It would have taken him ten seconds. Maybe he didn't think of it because he was distracted by planning to kill his wife, I suggested, and got a glare for my trouble. Sabiha knocked on the bedroom door at five past eight. The door was closed, but not locked. She opened it and found the curtains were closed and one of the bedside lights was on. They were both in bed and both very dead. Liv closed her notebook. And that was all she had to say. She called a family friend because he'd been there over the weekend instead of the usual son. She wasn't sure it was the right thing to do, but the son was away, apparently. So she followed his instructions and called the friend. Don't they have two sons? I looked over at the holiday photo, checking. I did ask. The second one is more or less no contact with the family, apparently. The friend is Dennis Hood. He came round, had a quick look to make sure she wasn't mistaken, although I don't know how you could be wrong about something like that, and he called us straight away. And where is he now? Derwent demanded. The flat next door. He's waiting to be interviewed. He was in a bit of a state, so the neighbours took him in. Poor man. It's not what you expect on a Monday morning. I don't really want to talk to him until we've seen the bodies. Derwent checked his watch and sighed. What about the sons? Have we tracked them down? Not yet. Why not? Derwent asked the question with deadly politeness, but Liv knew him well enough to quail. I was here waiting for you. They need to be informed, don't you think? As the next of kin. I'll get on it straight away. Liv hurried out of the room, her face red, and I shook my head. Not necessary and not kind. She needs to raise her game. He was standing with his back to me, 
looking out over the park. Concentrate on the job, not her kid. She's doing her best. No, she's not. He glanced at me. If she's working with you, she needs to be alert. I don't want any harm to come to you while she's on the phone to her childminder. I can look after myself. A genuine smile narrowed his eyes. It's sweet that you believe that. But someone usually has to keep you out of trouble. Oh, is that what you've been doing? I don't feel you've done a very good job. Imagine how much worse it could have been without me. Or better, I said. It might have been better. Maeve. A note of reproach this time. I abandoned the teasing and wandered around the living room and dining room, taking a closer look at the few personal effects I'd noticed. Everything reinforced my first impression that this wasn't much of a home. I picked up the painting that had been leaning against the dining room wall and straightened to discover that Derwent was inches away from me. What have you got there? I held it out so we could look at it together. You might know. Was that their house? Looks like it. The house was in Richmond, wasn't it? By the river. The river was at the end of their garden. I remember that much. The painting was amateurish, the grain of the canvas visible through the thin layer of paint. But it was still recognisably a Georgian house with a fan light and dormer windows at the attic level. Trees crowded around it, and a wide lawn filled the foreground. I tilted the frame, trying to read the artist's signature, but it was a squiggle. One of the theories was that the girl drowned. They never found a body. You know bodies don't always come to the surface. It's possible she did. Lots of things were possible. It was one of those cases. Many theories and not enough facts. Kidnapping, accident, murder, or your best guess. But the girl never came to light again, dead or alive. Derwent brooded on it. I knew the first SIO. I should let him know about the parents as a courtesy. I think it's strange that it all died down so quickly, I said. We're both struggling to remember the details. You'd think the media would have covered the case over and over again given that she was a pretty little girl from a wealthy family. But the story just faded out of the spotlight. The mother was famous, wasn't she? A media type. They look after their own. I had a vague memory of a blonde with self-consciously tasteful clothes and a heavy hand with eyeliner. She had been famous for being famous before she turned into some sort of campaigner. I'm not sure she was a media type, but she was good at generating outrage, from what I remember. Derwent was standing behind me, so close that I could feel the warmth of his body against mine in the slightly chilly dining room. The flat's heating was switched off to preserve the crime scene in the best possible condition, and I had been regretting the lack of my big coat. He had been keeping his distance lately literally and emotionally, and I had wondered if I'd done something wrong. There was every chance it was nothing to do with me. A late devotion to professionalism, perhaps. Or maybe it was the best way to deal with the attraction that had been smouldering between us since the previous summer. The attraction that I was never, ever going to admit again, let alone act upon. And since Derwent was fully committed to his girlfriend, her son and the suburbs, I didn't need to worry about it. But I still longed to lean back against him, just for a moment. Sixteen years ago, he said. Do you think it prompted whatever happened here? Grief can be difficult like that. It hides for years, and then it overwhelms you. It was all business, not lover-like. I gave myself a mental shake. Do you know what else can be difficult to live with? Guilt. About the daughter. I'm just saying, 
there were rumours about what happened. Both of the parents were arrested at different times, weren't they? The investigating team had a good look at them anyway. Maybe some new information came to light. Another reason to talk to my mate. Find out what the team really thought about the little girl. Sorry to interrupt. Kev leaned in through the open door. Dr. Early has arrived at last. 7. For someone so robust, Derwent had his squeamish side. He hustled me down the hall to the bedroom where the marshals lay dead. Let's get in and out before the doc does her stuff with the thermometer. I didn't argue. It wasn't my favourite part either. Kev was standing by the door. Gloves. Stay on the footplates. Try not to move around too much or touch anything. Seriously? Derwent raised his eyebrows. Still? He grimaced. You never know, do you? You only need one bad day in court to play it safe forever. I stepped carefully into the room to find the doctor, thin and eager, surveying the bodies. She looked up. Sorry I'm late. Behind me, Derwent turned a chuckle into a cough. Have you seen them already? I shook my head, and she gestured to the bodies. Have a look. Kev had lit the scene in merciless detail with bright white halogen lights on stands. They bleached out the warmer glow from the bedside lamp on Bruce Marshall's side of the bed. A cordless telephone sat on the table too, along with a couple of books. On Helena's side of the bed, there was nothing but a full water glass, a paper napkin covering it. The room was tidy. Nothing seemed out of place on the chest of drawers that faced the bed. Brushes, a mirror, a man's watch. Cream carpet, cream walls, curtains striped in blue and green. The same old-fashioned style as the rest of the flat. It made me feel suffocated. The curtains stirred gently, moving in a draught. I drew the nearest curtain back with a gloved hand. The sash was raised a couple of inches, but there were stops on either side so the window couldn't be opened any further. I rattled it to check it was secure, confirming that no one had come in or gone out that way. And then I focused on the double outrage at the centre of the scene. Helena Marshall was lying on her back, her face slack and hollow in the way of the dead. I remembered her as a tall, glamorous woman, but the figure in the bed was frail. Her eyebrows and eyelashes were sparse, and her hair spread out across the pillow in lank strands. Her mouth gaped open, a dark void. I shone my torch over her face, feeling that I was intruding. Her skin was waxy yellow, flecked with red petechiae. There was a pillow lying crumpled against her side of the bed, as if someone had let it fall there. Presumably that's what killed her, Derwent said into the silence, and I winced, as if we might disturb them by speaking too loudly. It's been photographed, Kev said. I'll be bagging it. I'd expect to find saliva on it if it was used to smother her, Dr. Early said, and Kev nodded. Worth checking for trace fibres, too. No blood? I asked. Not that I can see at present. Kev, cagey as ever. Then she probably died before that happened. That was lying in the bed beside her, and all up the wall behind the headboard, and sprayed across the lampshade and the phone. Red, predominantly. The top of Bruce Marshall's head was a soft mass of blood and brain and pulverised bone, and his face was horribly distorted from the explosive force that had blown his skull apart. I didn't know he'd shot himself. Liv left that detail out. Derwent was grim. 
he made his way around to Bruce's side of the bed for a closer look at the weapon. A Webley. We don't see that very often. Usually a shotgun for a gun suicide. They're easier to come by. Do you think that was an old weapon? Well, I don't think he went to Tottenham and borrowed it from his man, Dem. Derwent was crouching by the bed, peering at it. I bet you a thousand pounds that was a service revolver. Could have been his dad's from the Second World War. It hasn't been cleaned in donkey's years. He should have handed it in when they had the amnesty after Dunblane. There must be thousands of firearms that were stuck in the back of a drawer decades ago, or in an attic, and no one even remembers they're there. This could have been one of them. But he had ammunition for it. Derwent shrugged. Why would he dispose of the ammunition if he'd forgotten to get rid of the gun? Have you seen enough? Dr. Early asked. He nodded and stood up, but he was still looking at the two bodies as he moved towards the door, and he was frowning. I felt like frowning myself. Kev, were the bed covers like this when you arrived? I asked. Haven't touched them. I stood for a moment longer, taking it in. Even though I would be able to look at videos of the scene and crime scene photographs, nothing was as good as being able to stand in the room with the bodies. This was the last place Helena and Bruce Marshall had breathed. This was where their souls had departed. An act of love, some might think. Or a final revenge. Or something else entirely. I caught up with Derwent in the second bedroom. He was looming over Liv. How's it going? I looked from him to her, noting the suspicious sheen in her eyes. Is everything okay? I've made a start on the boxes. Her voice wavered and she cleared her throat. Reams of files about the daughter's disappearance. Interviews, maps, photographs. Police files? No, they hired private investigators. They must have spent a fortune. I recognised a couple of the names as retired cops, though. That doesn't mean they did a good job, Derwent said. No, but it tells you the marshal sought out professionals to be involved in the investigation. They really wanted to find out what happened to her. I wonder if any of the private detectives worked on the original case, I said. Maybe the marshals wanted people who had nothing to do with the investigation because they weren't happy that the police focused on them. It must have been frustrating when the marshals knew they didn't do it, Liv said. They were the most likely suspects, Derwent said, statistically. Yes, statistically. I caught a raised eyebrow from him and doubled down. There are exceptions to the statistics. We've caught a few of them ourselves. There are also good reasons for looking at close family when someone dies. Statistically, women are most likely to be killed by their partners. And here we are, another dead woman beside her loving husband. Yes, but... Uh, I trailed off. Was I ready to start sharing half-formed theories with Derwent? But what? His eyes narrowed with suspicion. What did you say to Kev when you were leaving the bedroom? I asked him if the covers had been moved since the bodies were discovered. The bedclothes looked fine to me. Nothing much was out of place, apart from the pillow. Well, that's what I was wondering about. He considered it, frowning in concentration. I knew that he wouldn't ask me what I thought, that he preferred to work it out by himself. Wasn't there anything that bothered you about the scene? He hesitated. Then, I didn't want there to be anything wrong with it, if I'm honest. I wanted this to be straightforward. But, there was one thing. I don't know. He stopped as a voice in the hallway made us turn the doctor on our way out, calling goodbyes. Dr. Early? I hurried to the door. 
Could you come in here? She came, but she was checking her watch at the same time. I've got to go. I'm late. I'm sure you want to know time of death, but it would only be a guess at this stage. Uh, no, I wanted to check something else before the bodies are moved. What was Helena Marshall's cause of death? Probably suffocation with something soft, such as a pillow. She has bruising to her upper lip and nose that's consistent with the application of considerable pressure. I suspect her nose was fractured. I'll know more when I've excised the damaged tissue and examined it under a microscope. She pulled on her coat, preparing to leave. I should be able to fit in the PMs this afternoon. I tried not to think about the doctor removing chunks of the dead woman's face. Dr. Early's assistants were magicians when it came to making bodies look presentable, so their loved ones could recognise them afterwards. But I would know the truth. I noticed she was flat on her back, with her arms by her sides, and the bedclothes weren't rumpled. Is it possible that she cooperated with being suffocated? It's more likely she was unaware of what was happening. She frowned. You'd have thought... It's involuntary, the kicking, and the arms coming up when someone is deprived of oxygen. It's a reflex. She couldn't have remained still by force of will. But if she was already unconscious? If she was deeply unconscious, her movements might have been slighter. Or he straightened the bedclothes before he killed himself, Derwent said. Left everything neat and tidy. Yes, but there's a problem with that, isn't there? You noticed the position of the bodies too. He folded his arms, mulish. I don't know what you mean. Liar, I said, without heat, and saw a gleam of amusement in his eyes. Want to act it out? No. That's a good idea, actually. Dr. Early's scientific mind was always delighted by experiments. Liv shrugged at me unable to intervene. Come on. Derwent led us into the living room, taking off his jacket and rolling up his sleeves. More floor space in here. He lay down and patted the carpet beside him. You be Helena, Maeve. I'll be Bruce. No point in arguing. I sat on the floor and shuffled into position before lying back, my shoulder lined up with his. Closer, Dr. Early said, helpfully. The bed was narrow. We edged towards one another until our arms were pressed together. Helena had her hands by her sides, Liv pointed out. My knuckles brushed against Derwent's thigh as I moved into the right position, and I cringed, rigid with embarrassment. Why had I started this? The bedclothes weren't tucked in, Dr. Early said. So if she'd tried to fight him off, they would have slid down. L let's assume Bruce was her murderer. Derwent turned his head and stared into my eyes. I'm in bed beside you, and I decide the time is right to kill you. He sat up and twisted around, reaching across me. I press my pillow over your face. No, he'd need more force than that, Dr. Early demonstrated. Two hands, pushing straight down. It's harder than you'd think to suffocate someone. People assume it's a gentle death, but a few years ago at a music festival, some Dutch scientists got a random selection of people of different ages and sizes to smother a dummy to see what the natural methodology is where they put their hands and weight, and how long they can sustain a lethal amount of pressure. It takes some doing. Big, strong men are better at it than small, frail women, and a lot depends on the angle of attack. I'll take your word for it. Derwent frowned. Bruce wasn't a robust man, was he? I think he'd have had to get out of bed, come round to Helena's side, and smother her while standing over her. I said. Or he did it before he got into bed. That, or he would have had to straddle her. He could have held her arms down with his knees. Go on. Dr. Early was intent on the experiment. 
my eyes went to Liv. She was chewing her bottom lip, half amused, half wary. Beside me, Derwent shifted his weight onto his left hand and knee and eased his right thigh across my hips. His right hand came down beside my ear, and he paused for a moment, his arms braced, his body over mine. I tried to breathe normally and failed. Then, kneeling astride me, but as if I wasn't even there, he straightened up to address Dr. Early. I'm not going to put my weight on her arms. No, it would bruise. I'll take a close look at Helena's elbows at the PM. But even if I didn't, he brought his knees in tight against me, so my arms were trapped. He leaned forward again, his hands flat on the carpet on either side of my head. He was watching me intently. I hoped I looked unmoved, but he grinned down at me, not food for a second. I'm holding the covers down too, you realise. And in this position, I can exert maximum force. Neat and effective. It wouldn't have taken long. Dr. Early took a picture on her phone, looking at me in surprise when I protested. Just for my records. Okay. Of course, the doctor hadn't taken a picture of us in that position for fun. I regrouped. But whatever approach he took, he would have had to move from his side of the bed. And even if he was holding her arms down, her legs would have been free to move as she died. He might have remade the bed afterwards, straightened things up, adjusted the covers so they were pulled up to mid-chest for both of them, and then... what? Got the gun out, Derwent said, levering himself off me and returning to his original position. Loaded the gun, possibly. He could have stashed it in his bedside table, ready to use. He turned away from me, reached towards an imaginary table, and loaded an imaginary gun, lay back, and mimed pointing the gun into his mouth. He shoots himself in the head, blood everywhere. The recoil could have made his hand fall back on his chest, Dr. Early said. Yes, but look at how we're positioned, I said. I'm dead, so I'm not moving. He's been busy sorting out the bed and getting ready to blow the top of his head off. Where does Bruce end up? Derwent looked down at his shoulder, which was in front of mine. Yeah, that's not how it was. His left arm was under hers. So, he was the one who died first. Liv frowned. But the blood covered both of them. She had flecks of it all over her face. If he died first, the blood on her face should have been smeared by the pillow pressing down on it. His blood should have been all over the pillow too. And obviously, he couldn't kill her if he was dead. I didn't want to say it. I think they might both have been unconscious when they died, unable to fight back. It was staged, Derwent said softly. And I nodded. Not a murder-suicide after all. Just a straightforward double murder. Eight. The stairwell was quiet, and I paused to notice the silence. The flats were solidly built, and the soundproofing seemed excellent, which was good for the residents, but bad for us. So far, no one seemed to have heard anything. Derwent swung out of the flat behind me as if someone was chasing him. Where are you going? To see Dennis Hood. He's been waiting for ages next door. On your own? Yeah, I think I can manage it by myself. He looked surprised and for an unguarded moment, hurt. Then the mask snapped back into place. Maybe you can, and maybe you can't. Let's not assume anything. I made a small, helpless gesture. All right, come with me if you like. I just... He stopped. I haven't been working with you for a while. And I enjoy it. 
so I thought I'd come along. Straightforward honesty from Derwent. It was more unsettling to me than any sarcasm or insinuation. I wondered if it was a trick or if he really meant it. And it was only when Dennis Hood was sitting in front of us, blank-eyed with shock, that I stopped thinking about it and came back to full attention. We had all refused the offer of tea, and the marshal's neighbour had retired, hurt, to her kitchen. I can't drink any more of it. Hood looked down at his hands, which were shaking. She's given me cup after cup of it. People don't know what to do or say in these situations. Tea is a way of providing comfort, I said. I just don't like it much. He was a slim man with cropped silver hair and a beard. And I wondered if the shock had aged him or if he was always so frail. He looked lost in the large velvet-covered armchair. First of all, I'm so sorry. Were you friends with the marshals? For a long time. Decades. With Bruce, really. We're the same age. He gave a dry little laugh. We were. I should be used to this by now. Friends die off in handfuls when you reach this stage in life. So you were close? At one time. But I hadn't seen them in years. I had moved away, you see, with my wife, before Rosalie disappeared. When I lived near them, I was friends with Bruce, and I saw him regularly. But sometimes we would go a few months without seeing each other. We always picked up where we left off. I thought that nothing would change after we moved. Then Rosalie disappeared, and they were never the same again. I tried to keep in touch, but it was difficult. It can be very hard to move on from something like that, especially with the uncertainty. I sometimes think it's easier to know the truth, even if it's bad news. Mr. Hood looked at me approvingly. You're a nice woman. It's just that I've seen a lot of sadness. I could feel Derwent studying the side of my face, and I flipped the page of my notebook. Where do you live now, Mr. Hood? I have a house in Bristol. Not as grand as the one in Richmond when I lived near Bruce and Helena. But I'm on my own now, he sighed. They had a wonderful life with the family. Just the kind of thing you might dream of. Then Rosalie... He broke off, shook his head. We were all devastated, of course. The investigation took up so much of their time and energy from that point on. I did try to be supportive. That can be difficult, Derwent said quietly. Well, Helena made it difficult. He ran a hand down his thigh, suddenly awkward. I'm speaking frankly. Please do. She was the kind of person who took offense easily. She would wait for someone to say the wrong thing and then attack. I suspected it was her way of relieving her pent-up feelings of grief and guilt, because she was bad at admitting that she had any emotions at all. But it was rather like juggling live grenades. It wasn't a case of whether there would be an explosion, but when. So you lost touch. I couldn't be around them. It was too painful. He sighed. I feared that something like this would happen. They became completely dependent on one another in a very unhealthy way. They shut everyone else out. I didn't even know that they'd left the house in Richmond until the other day. Why did they leave the house? A combination of things. From what Bruce said. Money, for one. It was a beautiful house, but always in need of some kind of repair. I remember Helena complaining that everything leaked. And then it was big for the two of them on their own once the boys left. 
What about their health? How would you say they were? I was shocked when I saw Bruce. He lost a lot of weight. He used to be fitter than me. Mind you, I'm on a stick too. He managed a weak smile. I've had a new knee and a new hip, and I think I was better off with the old ones. What about Helena? I asked. Do you know what was wrong with her? She took an overdose a while after Rosalie, you know. She was never the same. She barely spoke when I was with them over the weekend. I think Bruce was glad to have some company. I can imagine. He hesitated. I wondered if Bruce was developing dementia. He was very vague at times. He seemed to lose the thread of what he was saying. And once or twice he spoke to me about things I hadn't said, like that I was going to Egypt. I told him he had me confused with someone else, and he became quite distressed. If you're talking to the boys, you might ask them if they had noticed any cognitive decline. Their GP would know, presumably, Dowen said. They never saw the same one twice, according to Bruce. It's not like the old days, where you knew your doctor and your doctor knew you. And moving wouldn't have helped, obviously. They hadn't had time to get to know people, neighbours and so forth. Not like it was in Richmond with Dr. Fuller. His face softened at the memory, his eyes wet. Why did you come to see them now, after so long, Mr. Hood? I asked. I put it off and put it off. There was always some excuse for me to avoid coming to London. And then I thought I wasn't getting any younger, and neither were my friends, and I should make the effort to travel while I could. The letter I sent them bounced back, but I got hold of Ivo. Tell me about yesterday. I was with them all day, from about eleven until six. Their carer was there when I left. Bruce was fairly cheerful, if anything. I was planning to call in this morning to say goodbye, and he said he'd see me then. Mr. Hood shook his head. Hard to imagine he was already planning to do what he did. When the carer called me, I, I was floored, absolutely floored. Why did she call you? I asked. I'd left Bruce my number in the kitchen in case he ran into any difficulties. Their son, Ivo, usually comes to the rescue. But Ivo had asked for the weekend off, and I was glad to be able to help. I wasn't thinking of anything like this, obviously. He raised a hand to his forehead, his fingers trembling. For this to happen when Ivo was away... But perhaps that was why Bruce decided to do it now. The carer rang me. I got dressed and went to the flat, which was five minutes from my hotel. I had a quick look at the situation, called the police and removed myself so I wasn't in the way. I didn't want to stay. He blinked, his eyes watering. Bruce was a good friend to lose him like that, and to see what he'd done to Helena. It was upsetting. He must have thought it was the best way out. I leaned back, my elbow brushing against Derwent's arm. Both of us jumped. I recovered to say, Would it surprise you to hear that we're treating it as a double murder, rather than a murder-suicide? What? Really? He looked stunned. Someone killed them? Heavens. They're poor boys. Who could possibly? But then, I was so upset to think of Bruce being in such terrible distress when I hadn't noticed. He was talking to himself more than to us. 
I mean, yes. Murder. My God. That changes everything. Nine. Dennis Hood was right. A double murder did change everything. An hour after Derwent had called our boss, Detective Superintendent Una Burt, there were eight of us standing in the faded, chintzy living room. Dr. Early said it might take a while to get the lab results back so we can see if they were drugged, I explained. Why would you need to drug them? Pete Belcott looked around at our blank faces. They wouldn't have been difficult to overpower. Shut up, Pete, Derwent said. Just stop talking. Pete blinked, wounded. He was stocky, with heavily greased hair. And I had hated working with him since day one. Time and proximity had only made me sure I was right to dislike him. I was only saying, we heard what you were saying. If it was someone who knew them well, like a family member, they might have wanted to avoid a confrontation, I said. Or maybe the killer didn't want to leave anything to chance. Una frowned. Is it possible Mr. Marshall gave his wife an overdose and then killed himself? I don't want to commit major resources here unnecessarily. There's the position of the bodies too, I said quickly, as Derwent's expression darkened. He didn't like being questioned, and particularly not by Una. The bodies could have been moved by whoever discovered them. This carer, and who else? Their friend? I spoke to the carer, Liv said, and she was adamant that neither of them had touched the bodies, except that Dennis Hood checked for a pulse in Helena's neck. He didn't bother with Bruce, given that half his head was missing. Yes, thank you, Josh. Have we spoken to Mr. Hood yet? Just now, I said. I sent him back to his hotel. Are you suggesting that we got this wrong, boss? Derwent asked. Hoping. The last thing I need is another complex investigation. So what's the plan? Her mouth thinned. He was passing it back to her to make the final decision on what we did, as was right and proper, given that she was his boss. But we all knew there was really no choice about it. Treat it as a double homicide for now. Do you think the family background is significant? The missing daughter? It's worth assuming there's a connection. Most families never experience one major crime, let alone two. Little Rosalie Marshall, Una said, almost to herself. I don't remember that case, Georgia said, and Vidya shook her head too. It dropped out of the headlines quickly, Derwent explained. The family didn't seek out publicity. That's unusual, isn't it? Colin blinked behind his heavy glasses. He was the sort of man who always looked as if his anorak was close at hand, even if he wasn't actually wearing it. Today, he was wearing it. The family's usually desperate for publicity. The Marshals got the wrong sort of publicity, Una Burt said. The report started out sympathetic, and then the tone changed. There were circumstances that made the investigation focus on the parents, rather than widening the net. You can understand why they shunned the limelight after that. I'd like to find out what the investigating team made of them, Derwent said. I was planning to get in touch with the SIO. Yes, good, do that. She looked at me expectantly. I'm going to speak to the carer again. Who let her leave? Sorry. Liv's face was flaming. Liv didn't know there was any reason to keep her here, I said, defensive. But you did, Maeve. Unabert was always one to put the boot in where she could. I knew the remark was intended to make Liv feel she'd fucked up. People depend on her. I'm not sure I'd have insisted. Bert registered the descent with a twitch of one eyebrow and moved on. Colin, can you review whatever security there was here? CCTV, obviously. I noticed a couple of cameras in the hall downstairs. 
I've already been making a list. Of course you have. Her face softened. Unibert lived for efficiency, and people who kept their emotions neatly under wraps at work. And Colin was ideal in both respects. We need to speak to all the neighbours. Vidya and Georgia start on the top floor and work down. Pete, you start on the ground floor. You can meet in the middle. Pete would do far less than the two women and complain about it much more. Oh, you can go with them, Liv, Una said casually. Along with his many undesirable attributes, Pete regularly questioned Liv about her partner Joanne and what they might do with one another, so I knew she liked to avoid him. She looked down at the floor and blinked furiously. I turned to Bert, ready to argue the point, but Derwent got there first. If Pete isn't capable of routine inquiries on his own at this point in his career, he's in the wrong job. Hey, Pete said in protest. Derwent ignored him. Liv can keep working through the spare bedroom. There's stacks of information, literally. He threw Liv his car keys. It's too much for you to take in one journey, so let's share it out between vehicles. Start with the first stack next to the door. It probably has the most recent material in it. I'll take that lot back to the Nick. She nodded, and I felt a glow of gratitude to Doant for finding her a way out. I kept my face absolutely impassive, however. Una didn't like being bested, and she didn't like people taking Derwent's side over hers, and she didn't like me all that much. Recently, she had received her longed-for promotion and permanent control of our team, so she was two full ranks above Derwent, and therefore entitled to demand respect. The trouble was that Derwent didn't do respect. Moreover, Rank had no influence on his opinion of people, which was one reason why he was still an inspector. The miracle was that he'd ever managed to get promoted in the first place. With seniority came wisdom about which battles were worth fighting, and Una wisely decided this wasn't one of them. Right, good. Is everyone happy? Who's speaking to the family? Georgia asked. It's just the two sons. Response officers are informing them, Derwent said. You didn't think it was important to get their reaction? I would have wanted to go myself instead of handing the job off to uniforms. Unabert's neck was blotched with pink, a sure sign that she'd lost her temper. I don't actually think it'll make the difference between a conviction and them going free if I'm not standing right in front of them when they hear the news. And the officers have body-worn cameras. We'll have a record of how they react if they don't know already. Then that's all right. Exactly what I thought. He held her gaze for a moment longer, then looked away. There was no warmth between the superintendent and her inspector. Right, everyone. Get going. Josh, you'd better show me the bedroom. With very bad grace, Derwent set off and she followed, taking two strides to every one of his, bobbing along on stumpy legs, without grace in her movements or her manner. And yet, there was a part of me that respected her for her confidence. I wished I knew how she did it. The room emptied after Bert left, Georgia and Vidya with their heads together, Pete yawning as he went. Colin had slipped away first, on the hunt for his CCTV. Liv sat down in the chair on one side of the fireplace and buried her face in her hands. Are you all right? Sort of. Not really. I sat in the chair opposite her. What's up? Was it what Bert said to you? A bit. Liv ran her fingers under her eyes, smearing the tears away. She wasn't wrong. I didn't do a very good job when I got here. I missed loads of stuff. But I'm so tired. And I've got a headache. I have painkillers. I took some. An hour ago. She sniffed. I'm falling apart, Maeve. You're not. You're just exhausted. It's hard, coming back to work. I thought I'd be happy. 
Two more tears streaked down her cheeks. I was so glad to be back. Was Josh giving you a hard time about it too? No, not at all. I, I thought he made you cry earlier, after we viewed the bodies. He was being nice. She rubbed at her cheeks. He told me to make Joanna do her share and blame him if she complains. He said I was important to the team. Relief made me smile. It'll get easier. I still don't think you did anything wrong. I lowered my voice even more. If I didn't know better, I'd think Una has an in for you. She wanted me to leave the team, so you're probably right. Because you can't work and be a mother. I had one eye on the doorway, in case Bert appeared unexpectedly. <laughs> Apparently. Liv shrugged. That's the choice she made, I suppose. But I can tell you she disapproves like hell of mine. We all make choices. There's no such thing as the perfect life. Everyone has to sacrifice something, somewhere along the way. I sat back, shifting my weight in the chair. Thanks, Maeve. You know, I was thinking... She broke off. Are you even listening to me? I was pulling on a glove, preparing to delve down the side of the armchair between the cushion and the frame. I think I heard something. It rustled when I moved. Hang on. It was a piece of paper, lined, torn roughly from a notepad. On it, someone had scrawled a few words in pencil. B D K? Question mark. How? Question mark. Check dates. The last line was underlined twice, so hard that the pencil had dug through the paper. What's that? It was down the side of the chair, a note. Is it important? Liv was too good a police officer not to be interested instantly. Do you think it was hidden deliberately? I'd say it was pushed down so no one could see it. I snapped a picture of it with my phone. The writing looked urgent, as if it had been scribbled under great pressure. Liv came over to look at it as I went hunting for an evidence bag. Does it mean anything to you? I slipped it into the bag. No, not yet. But I'll work it out. Ten. Is that all? Derwent tilted the scrap of paper inside the evidence bag, as if it might reveal some hidden message. I just thought it might be relevant. It's not exactly going to secure a conviction. He handed it back to me, and I pressed my lips together to stop myself from arguing with him. I have to go. I'm meeting the carer. I was glad to escape the flat, which was beginning to look like it was in the middle of a thorough burglary. Every drawer hung open, every cupboard door was ajar, and every surface was piled high with things that we had ferreted out to inspect. I'll come too. He hustled me towards the door, murmuring, If we stay, she'll find something shitty for me to do. She was Una Burt, who had spent a lot of time making it very clear that she wasn't going to interfere with how Derwent ran the investigation, and then proceeded to do exactly that. Superintendent Bert to you, I said, once we were out of range. She's not exactly wearing the promotion lightly. You are being careful with her, aren't you? He looked at me for a second with that unnerving focus. She can't get rid of me. I get results, and that makes her look good. She doesn't have to like me to know she needs me. Maybe, but play it safe. Worried about me? Frequently. He stretched, effortlessly arrogant. You'd miss me if I was gone. Is that a statement or a question? A statement. But I want to hear you say it. Well, you can want. I'm not here to pander to your ego. That got a genuine grin from him, and he fell into step beside me easily as we walked down the road. The weak spring sunshine made the bare trees in the park gleam. 
Where are we meeting Sabiha? She has another client on Prince of Wales Drive. She should be free in a few minutes. I said I'd drive her to the next one so she can spare us fifteen minutes. The poor woman doesn't seem to have much time to herself. All her clients are within walking distance of here, but only just, and she's on the move constantly. Crappy job, Derwent said. A necessary one. Well, obviously. They're like us. They clean up people's shit and don't get thanked for it. I think our pay and conditions are better. Only just, probably. Derwent checked his watch. Do we have time to get coffee before we interview her? No. And why are we interviewing her anyway? I'm starting to think you're checking up on me again. I thought I'd proved myself today. Hood wasn't what I'd call a difficult interview. He relented. You got him to trust you. You made him like you. Classic Maeve. So, shadowing me when I interview Sabiha isn't because you think I'll do a bad job? He looked surprised. No, of course not. I was only teasing when I said that about Hood. Then, why? What do you mean? Tread carefully, I thought. It's just that over the last couple of months, if anything, I'd have said you were avoiding me. As you said, we haven't worked together much. <sighs> That's ridiculous. He seemed relaxed to the point of torpor. It was only the tightness around his eyes that was a giveaway. Is it? I've barely seen you since Christmas. You've been working with Vija a lot. Jealous, are we? Certainly not. I noticed it, that's all. And so did Georgia, who feels left out. Vidya's got the potential to be a decent copper, unlike Georgia. A sidelong glance. She appreciates my expertise. I'm sure she does, but so do I. You've left me to work with Liv. Liv needs a sympathetic colleague while she settles back into the job. Yes? And Chris Pettifer needs what, exactly? We don't have time to make a list of everything Chris needs. Well, he doesn't need me, I said. And as for Liv, she would be furious if she knew you were encouraging me to hold her hand. The best way to get her confidence back is to let her face the difficult situations head on, instead of protecting her from them. It's not that I don't want to help her, but she's got to feel she can cope on her own. That's not always easy, Maeve. He said it gently, but there was something in his tone that brought me up short. There was more going on here than I could understand. If I wanted him to be honest with me, I needed to risk being honest with him. Look, I know I sound whiny. It's just that I miss you when we aren't working together. His mouth tensed, but he said nothing. And I think you miss me too, which is why you're acting like my shadow now that we have the excuse to be together. I stood still, and he carried on for a couple of paces. Then slowly, reluctantly, came back to face me. But I don't understand why we need an excuse, Josh. It was after last summer. Last summer, I repeated, when we were undercover. We had been posing as a couple to catch a killer. You know what happened? Nothing, I said it quickly, and he raised his eyebrows. Not quite accurate, is it? I knew that I was blushing. Nothing that need trouble anyone. It troubled Melissa. Oh. But that's not new, is it? She's always been... Protective of you? Melissa had transformed Derwent into a family man, instead of the restless womanizer he had been when I first knew him. I assumed it had taken constant vigilance, at least in the early days of their relationship. Delicately pretty and gentle, she had been sweet to me, but with a touch of reserve that I recognized as a warning. Back off, he's mine. 
And until recently, I hadn't minded. Derwent gave me a rueful grin, knowing exactly what I meant. This was different, I suppose. The amount of time we spent together. And the circumstances. And how I was when I came back. I knew how he had been. Unhappy and unable to hide it. What happened? Did she make you promise not to work with me? She tried. I said no. I told her she couldn't control my job and how I do it. I let her call the shots in almost every other aspect of my life. I decide how often I see Luke, and I decide what happens at work. And other than that, she's in charge. Luke was Derwent's son, a self-possessed twenty-something, who was the result of a teenage one-night stand. Melissa had not been pleased when he resurfaced, threatened by the new relationship Derwent was forming with him, which was ridiculous, I had wanted to tell her. Derwent had been devoted to her since he met her and her son, Thomas. He had committed himself to making them happy, whatever sacrifices that required him to make. She needed to learn to trust him, whatever she felt about me. I didn't care if she didn't like me much. It was nothing to do with me. But something Derwent had said stuck like a burr. If you're the one who decides what happens at work, it was your choice not to work with me. No. He looked around, then took a step closer, lowering his voice even though no one was near enough to hear us. Melissa got in touch with Una. She convinced her that you and I were on the verge of having an affair, if not actually over the side yet. She wanted you to be kicked off the team. I went hot and cold. She couldn't have. She did, and she didn't hold back. His face was grim. I had known Melissa was possessive of him, but not the extent of it. That was the difference I'd noticed in his face earlier. Tension, skillfully hidden. Una decided I shouldn't work with you unless there was no alternative. God, I'd sacrificed enough of my dignity to wring that concession out of her. The only thing that swung it in the end was that she knows you well enough to be sure you wouldn't have done anything with me yet, and you never would. Una told Melissa that she would keep an eye on me. On us. And you know what she's like. A steamroller in drip-dry non-iron polyester, I murmured. I was still thinking about what he had just said. You never would. He hadn't left a pause for me to comment either way, probably deliberately. It was what I thought myself. So why did I jib at hearing him say it? And you didn't tell me any of this because... Because I didn't want you to know. It was bad enough letting Una into my private life. I have to give her credit. She hasn't held it against me. She's not that kind of person. She plays fair but she expects the same in return. Exactly, and that's what I've been doing. I've worked with everyone but you. I thought it was something I'd done. No, definitely not. He made a move as if he was going to touch my arm, but seemed to change his mind. I'll still see you in the office, and on cases like this. Una's kicking herself, by the way because if she'd realised the investigation into the marshals was likely to be complicated, she'd have made someone else the SIO. But I'm hanging on to it. And to you. I told her it would be more awkward to take you off the case than to let it run. I promised I'd be on my best behaviour. God, that must have been hard. I expected him to make a joke in response, but there was a shiver of hurt in Derwin's voice when he replied. You have no idea. I would think about what he had said later, I decided. I checked my watch. We'd better get going. Sabiha will be waiting. Eleven. 
Sabiha was a tiny, sweet-faced woman in her twenties who wore a beige veil over her hair. She had suggested meeting at her client's home, but when I phoned her to tell her we had arrived at Cornwall Mansions, she asked me to wait outside. She emerged from the building a few minutes later, out of breath. Her eyes were red. I'm sorry, I thought we could meet inside, but my client wasn't happy. She squeezed her hands together, agonized. I think she was worried the neighbors would assume she was the one who was in trouble with the police. And now I'm wondering if she has something to hide. I smiled to show that I was joking. Please don't worry, Miss Koreshi. Sabiha, please. Is there a cafe anywhere near your next client where we could go? She shook her head. But we can talk here, on the street. The wind had picked up, and there was a keen edge to it. You're shivering, Derwent observed. So let's not do that. We'll sit in the car if you don't mind. Oh, thank you. She blinked up at him, doubtfully, as if she wasn't used to being on the receiving end of much thoughtfulness. I'm not cold, really, but I can't stop shaking. That shock. I unlocked the car and held open the door so she could climb into the back seat. Have you had anything to eat? I didn't feel like it. I had a glass of water. Leave it with me. Casually, Derwent leaned on the door with his full weight, so it slid out of my hand and closed on her with a soft thunk. He muttered, I'll get her something while you talk. She looks scared of her own shadow. I would guess most things scare her after what she saw this morning. It wasn't pretty. Bruce, in particular, was going to recur in my nightmares, and I'd seen plenty of violent deaths in my time. I'll try to be quick. I watched him lope across the road and disappear into the park. A tall and broad-shouldered figure, with enough natural authority to make the traffic stop for him with an imperious raised hand, on a mission to make an insignificant young woman feel slightly better on the worst day of her life. Then I gave myself a mental shake, looped around the car, and got into the back seat beside Sabiha. It might be easier to talk if I sit beside you. Is that all right? She nodded, biting her lip. I'm just asking you questions because you're a witness to what took place in the Marshal's home, but not because you're in trouble. I'm sorry to make you talk about all of this again. It must have been a difficult morning. A difficult day. She raised her hand to her head, her fingers trembling. N nothing has gone right for me. I can't seem to think properly. I'm sure it was traumatic to find them like that. It's not the first time that I've tried to wake a client and discovered they had passed. Some of our clients are very old and very sick. I have seen them die, even, but never from any violence before this. And the blood, the way he looked. Her eyes filled with tears again. He was always so kind, so pleasant, not like some of the clients. That he would do that to Mrs. Marshall, and then himself, it's hard to believe. She leaned back against the seat and closed her eyes for a moment, looking exhausted. When did you start working for the marshals? About five months ago. They liked to have the same person as much as possible, so they didn't have to explain every time what they wanted their carer to do. And it was good for me to have regular clients in the same area. The managers never schedule enough time for us to travel from one person to the next one. And if you are delayed by something, someone takes a little longer to eat a meal or to get ready for bed, the next client is upset. So you learn you need clients that live in a small area. And it was seven days a week. Twice a day, but only every other weekend. What were your duties? Mainly cleaning and housekeeping, but also to help Mrs. Marshall dress and undress and wash. Was she very unwell? She never spoke. A word here or there. 
she couldn't move very much, or hold small items, or cutlery. She couldn't manage for herself. Mr. Marshall spoke for her if I asked her a question. She ate because he told her to. He was in charge. He was keeping her alive. Sabiha smiled, remembering. He said, one day she would bloom again. And would she have recovered? It was permanent, her condition. Her brain was affected when she took an overdose. She had almost died, Ivo said. She said his name with a slightly different emphasis, lingering over the two syllables with tenderness that aroused my interest. What about Bruce? He was older than her. He needed a stick. He went for a walk every day in the park, though. What about his mind? Was he forgetful? Her brow furrowed. He was very careful not to forget things. He wrote everything down. Where? In a notebook. He kept it in his pocket. What did it look like? Small, red, lined paper, uh, a wire holding it together. I took a moment to translate that. Spiral bound. She traced circles in the air with her finger. L like this, down the side? Not expensive, just easy to carry around, I think. We hadn't found anything like that in the flat, as far as I knew. I took out my phone and opened the picture of the note I'd discovered down the side of the chair, zooming in so only a few letters were visible. Does this look like Mr. Marshall's writing? And does it look as if the paper came from the notebook? Yes, his writing. It could be the same paper, but I can't be sure. I put my phone away. Now, I want you to think about this morning. Try to remember what it was like when you went into the flat first. Did you notice anything different? Anything unusual? N no, nothing. That's why I cleaned the other rooms. The trembling was back, I noted. The police who came were angry that I'd done it, but I would never have touched anything if I'd known. Her small hands were clenched into fists in her lap. There was a note in the kitchen with Mr. Hood's phone number. Ivo always came at weekends. I was glad he had a weekend off. And then, when I found them, I couldn't think. I just remembered that I was supposed to call Mr. Hood, and I did. And he came. I was sitting on the kitchen floor when he arrived, and I don't remember how I got there. I know what that's like, I said with sympathy. How did Mr. Hood get in? There's a key safe beside the door. He had the code. I looked up to see Derwent coming back to the car. He got into the front seat and handed a cardboard cup to Sabiha and another to me. She had tea, mine was coffee, and I felt myself reviving as I sipped it. Careful, it's hot, Derwent warned. Sabiha was gulping her tea down. It's sweet. I put two sugars in. You need it when you've had a shock. He passed a paper bag back to her. That's just a pastry, but it should make you feel better. I waited until she had finished it before I asked my next question, aware that I was pushing into difficult territory. What about in the marshal's bedroom? Did you notice anything unusual or out of place, aside from the marshals themselves? I didn't really see the bodies. I was trying not to look at them. I opened the door, and it smelt wrong, and it was too quiet, so I knew something bad had happened. And the light by the bed was on, which wasn't usual, so I looked for a moment, and then, then I looked away. What else? Try to remember the rest of the room. There was a pillow on the floor next to Mrs. Marshall's side of the bed. She dropped her chin to her chest. 
you'll be angry. We're never angry when someone tells us the truth. Derwent sounded as if he was more or less incapable of losing his temper, as unflappable as an air traffic controller. I picked up the pillow, only for a second. Then I realized I shouldn't touch anything, and I put it down again. How did you hold it? I asked. By one corner? That shouldn't be a problem. I was thinking of what Dr. Early had said about the force needed to smother someone. Sabiha could hardly have obliterated any traces of the killer by holding onto it in one place. We'll need a sample of your DNA so we can be sure to eliminate you from our inquiries. But we would have wanted that anyway. Oh, thank goodness. Tears welled up over her lower lashes. I was so scared. All day. I've cried so much my head has been aching. I don't know why I did it. You said it was unusual for the lamp to be switched on in the morning. Was there anything else that was unusual? Was it normal for them to sleep with the windows open in their bedroom? No, unless it was very warm. And even then, they preferred to keep them shut, because Helena didn't like any noise from outside. Were they open? I didn't see that. The curtains were closed. A tiny gasp. Did someone break in? There were locks on the windows, so you couldn't climb in or out. That's what I thought. While I made a note about the windows, Derwent asked, Did they have many visitors? No, very few. Only their son. Maybe old friends like Mr. Hood, but not often. Did anyone else come to see them recently? She shook her head. Was Bruce worried about anything? He was always worried about his wife. Nothing else. Is there anything you want to tell us before we let you go? Derwent said at last. Anything strange that happened lately? She frowned. There was a man who tried to talk to me two weeks ago outside the building. He seemed to know I was working for the marshals. He asked me about them. By name? What did he want to know? If they lived there and which flat they lived in. I ran inside and shut the building door so he couldn't follow. Then Mr. Marshall called Ivo, and he came, and when I left, there was no sign of the man. Could you describe him? Maybe forty? Thin. He kept saying he was sorry to ask, sorry to bother me, sorry if I was upset, sorry to be a nuisance. He seemed shy. N not angry. He seemed worried. He said he needed to find them. And would you recognize him if you saw him again? I think so, she said. I might. I left Derwent to go back to the crime scene, while I drove Sabiha to her next client. And I chatted to her about where she lived, and how long she had been in London, and what she wanted to do with her life. But all the time, I was thinking about the apologetic stranger who had wanted to know where he could find the marshals. He didn't sound like the typical murderer, if such a thing existed. But then, this wasn't a typical murder. Twelve. I came back to the crime scene after dropping Sabiha off and made it as far as the door of the building where Una Bert was lying in wait. Maeve, can you follow up with the sons? No one from the team has seen them in person yet, and I'm not happy about it. Absolutely. I hesitated, finding it hard to look her in the eye, given what I knew about her opinion of me. Has Josh okayed it, or...? Her face was stony. He's gone back to the office with some of the files from the flat. Right, of course. I took the son's details from her and went back to the car. I rang Ivo's number first and confirmed his address. Clapham, 
a ten-minute drive from the flat in Battersea, and that he would be there all afternoon. He sounded calm and controlled, not at all like someone recently and violently orphaned, and I felt a prickle of curiosity. I rang Magnus's number and listened to his voicemail greeting, which was brief, left an equally short message with my number, and made tracks for Clapham. At first glance, Ivo Marshall's home was a grand red brick Victorian villa with a huge stained glass door, and I braced myself for ostentatious wealth. When he opened the door, I realised the house had been divided into two properties, and he had the lower one. In contrast to the Victorian exterior, the flat looked modern, with pearl grey carpet, pale walls and discreet recessed lighting all the way down the hall. Ivo Marshall himself was tall and well-built, with light brown hair. He had a square jaw and a straight nose. Deeply conventional good looks that could be more or less attractive depending on the personality that went with them. Sergeant Kerrigan, thank you for coming. You must be so busy. It's very good of you to take the time. Instant warmth, instantly likeable. I felt myself relaxing. Whatever our conversation involved, Ivor was the kind of person who would strive to make it easy for both of us, and I didn't encounter them too often in murder investigations. I could see why Sabiha might have had a crush on him. I'm sorry we couldn't get to see you earlier. I noticed he was barefoot and slid off my shoes. Oh, you don't mind. The carpet is new. We haven't accepted it will ever look dirty. He led the way down to the back of the flat. I caught glimpses of a sitting room with red painted bookshelves, a study with yellow walls, and a pair of bedrooms, one in tones of pale green, one pale blue. At the back of the hall, a short flight of stairs went down to the basement, which contained an enormous and very modern kitchen, where none of the appliances were visible, and everything was either black wood or gleaming brass. A mid-century dining table stood in front of a vast abstract oil painting, and a low fleecy sofa that looked like a cloud faced the television. Somehow they had contrived to make the space light and airy, despite being below street level, facing steps that rose to the lawn. It was like walking into a cover shoot for House and Garden. This is fantastic. Did you do it yourselves? Yes, just finished it a couple of months ago. This flat was a wreck before, and the basement didn't exist. My wife is an architect. She designed the whole thing and project managed it. It's a way of showing clients what she can do. And you get to live in it. I didn't try to hide my envy. But I also got to live through two years of building work. Ivo's excellent manners extended to offering me a cup of tea or a glass of water, or a drink of any kind, all of which I declined, despite being curious about where the fridge might be hiding in the inscrutable kitchen. I realised he was using politeness as a delaying tactic, warding off the moment when he would have to talk about his parents. I just have a few questions, Mr Marshall. Where would you prefer to sit? Oh, yes, uh, sorry. He chose a chair that was clearly a Danish design classic, leaving the sofa to me. I perched on the edge, trying to maintain my dignity instead of sinking into it. What do you know about what happened? Um, the police, your colleagues, told me they were found dead this morning by their carer. He shrugged, uneasy. I understood there were suspicious circumstances, given that both of them were dead at the same time. They said there was a murder investigation, but they couldn't tell me anything more. Or wouldn't, I suppose. Do you know how your parents died? N no they didn't say. He had folded his arms tightly, so he was hugging himself. They said that the bodies had been identified already. 
We'll be able to confirm it with DNA, but Sabiha was able to identify them, and Mr. Hood confirmed it. Hood, he was there, was he? Sabiha called him. Ivo nodded and smiled, although a muscle spasm in his cheek ruined the effect. The one weekend I have off in years, and this happens. Do you think it's significant that you weren't in charge this weekend? You mean, do I think Dad took the opportunity to kill my mother? I'm assuming that's what happened. The muscle spasm was worse now. There were aspects of the crime scene that made us question whether that was what happened. He frowned. She couldn't have done anything to him, if that's what you're thinking. She was almost completely helpless. If he was pretending that he didn't know how they had died, I couldn't spot it. I gather her poor health wasn't a recent development. No, she'd been in that state for years. So you can't possibly suspect her, can you? I left that one unanswered. At the moment, we're keeping an open mind about what happened. But it's suspicious. No doubt about that, I'm afraid. They both died violently. Violently? It looks as if your mother was suffocated and your father was shot. Shot? Ivo's voice cracked. Did he have a gun? A, a shotgun? He used to go shooting with friends, but I don't remember him having a gun. No, a handgun. What? A, a pistol? N no, th they're illegal, aren't they? Was your father the sort of person who would have obeyed the law and handed in a gun? even if it had some sentimental significance. It's an old gun, then. It's possible he decided to hold on to it, I suppose. He was a private sort of person. I'd never have gone through his belongings without his permission. He paused, gathering his thoughts. He was shot. Where? In their bedroom. He was in bed. I meant... He raised a hand and gestured at his body. It was a headshot. Pure shock in his face. Poor Sabiha, walking in on that. I'm glad Hood was around to help her. He's a capable sort of person. The Hoods were good friends, but they hadn't been in touch with my parents for a long time. So long that he wrote to the old house to try to find them. How long is it since your parents moved into the flat? Must be three years. I blinked. I assumed it was more recent. They didn't seem to have moved much in. They didn't have much left. They sold the Richmond house and most of the contents. But they borrowed so much against it that they only had a small amount to live on. It must have been possible to find somewhere cheaper to buy. They didn't buy it. The flat is a loan from a friend of my mother's. It belonged to her godmother, and she didn't need it when she inherited it. My parents paid rent, but it was a really tiny amount. Where did their money go? I think there was less of it than they pretended even when things were going well but they spent a fortune on medical bills and other expenses in the last few years. Because of your mother? Not just that. He swallowed, looking down. My sister disappeared. Rosalie. Oh, of course you know. I know what happened, but I don't know the details, I said. And he sighed. There isn't much to tell you. She disappeared from our house one night sixteen years ago, and no one ever saw her again. No one knows where she went, or what happened to her. She was only nine, and it broke my mother's heart. 
I understand Helena took an overdose. A little while later, yeah. She lived, but only just. She was brain damaged. She wound up in hospital for months and months. Ivo shook his head, as if he was trying to get rid of the memory of that time. Just disappeared. Like Rosalie. And even though Mum came back, she wasn't the same. We lost both of them. She needed help with basic tasks, is that right? She couldn't do anything, and she never got better. Ivo ran a hand over his face, wincing. We got angry with her, my brother and I. We were used to her sorting our lives out. We didn't like her being ill. Suddenly, she needed looking after, and no one had any time for us. Anger is completely understandable. You were kids, too. Teenagers. At least I was. Magnus was twelve. I was fourteen. She'd always been a bit of a tiger mother. I was relieved when she backed off after Rosalie disappeared. Then that was another thing to feel guilty about. I felt deeply sorry for him. Did you ever talk to anyone about it? A professional? He grinned suddenly. It's a pretty dark scenario to have to explain to a counsellor. They're used to bad divorces and absent fathers, not catatonic mothers and a family mystery with no solution. We had a couple of family sessions when Mum was in the rehab place trying to learn how to speak again, and it was too traumatic for Dad. He gave us a list of people we could talk to, people he could trust not to sell a story about us. Other than that, we didn't speak to anyone about Rosalie. The whole thing was hushed up. Most people want media interest when a family member disappears. Not us. Dad spent a fortune on PR advice and legal fees. So journalists would be too scared to write about us in case they got sued for defamation. He wanted me and Magnus to have our privacy growing up. He shook his head. The only thing media coverage ever got them was trouble. Mum had been a bit of a star before Rosalie disappeared. She wrote articles and gave speeches, and she was on Thought for the Day, or Woman's Hour, or some other radio show, every couple of weeks. She loved being controversial. She was the sort of woman everyone loves to hate. And of course, the circumstances made it even more ironic. What circumstances? I think Mum always wanted to be famous. She came up with the idea of campaigning for adoption instead of letting children go into care or leaving them in dangerous situations with their own parents. She wanted the process made quicker and safer for the kids, with the added advantage that nice middle-class parents like her could get their hands on babies rather than traumatised and difficult older children. I'm paraphrasing, obviously. She made common ground with the pro-life brigade, even though that wasn't her main interest. But they were pushing adoption as an alternative to abortion. That annoyed a lot of people. Which meant they were pleased because she hadn't managed to keep her own daughter safe. That seems harsh. It was. But she'd been pretty unbearable, I think. And Rosalie was the poster child for her scheme. So, Rosalie, he was nodding, Rosalie was adopted. Thirteen. Nothing like a bit of tragic irony to get the media interested. It explains why they were publicity shy, I said. My phone was propped on one of the boxes in the second bedroom of the Battersea flat, while I tried to organise the reams of paper that remained, after Liv and Derwent had taken a carload apiece. I was on my own, so I'd taken the risk of putting Derwent on speakerphone. You can imagine, after the second or third think piece about it, they started to feel attacked. That, and the fact that they were suspects. Adopting a kid is difficult. Maybe they struggled with her. 
Ivo said he thought the reality of having Rosalie was a shock to his mother. She sold an idealized vision of herself as a parent through her media work. But it was hard, at times, from what he remembered. You think they were responsible for her disappearance? I don't know enough about it. I levered the lid off a box and sighed at the sight of a stack of newspaper clippings. They used a cutting service. That costs a fair bit. Medical bills, lawyers, a PR company, private detectives. I'm beginning to see why they had no money left. I had already explained to Derwent how they had come to live in the flat. Or they were being blackmailed. I paused. Is that just a guess? Wild speculation. That's pretty much all we have at the moment. Have you found anything interesting in the boxes you took away? As if I'm going to bother reading any of it, Derwent said cheerfully. I have you for that. And Liv, if she has time. I'll try to get her to do some more interesting tasks, so she gets the love back for the job and feels appreciated. I don't want to tie her up with boring old background reading. I'll leave that for you. Oh, thanks very much. You don't want anyone to think I'm playing favourites, Maeve, do you? Derwent's voice was soft, too sweet to be sincere. I rolled my eyes as I lifted another box off the pile in front of me. You wouldn't. What did Ivo say about his parents' marriage? Before Rosalie disappeared, they were a pretty impressive partnership. He made the money and facilitated her work, and she kept the house running smoothly. They had nannies, but at the time Rosalie disappeared, there was just a tutor for his brother, part-time, and various other members of staff who came and went. A cleaner, a gardener. The brothers helped with Rosalie if Helena wasn't available. Did they mind having to look after their little sister? Ivo said not. He seems like the type who just does what needs to be done and doesn't complain. After Helena's overdose, Bruce gave up work to look after her. It was a total change of lifestyle, but Bruce was devoted to her. Ivo thought the way he behaved towards Helena was him taking his vows seriously, you know, in sickness and in health. Or... Bruce felt guilty about murdering Rosalie, which was the reason Helena OD'd, and he wanted to stop Helena from telling anyone what he'd done, so he made her totally dependent on him. I stopped leafing through a file for a second. That's dark, even for you. But a possibility, nevertheless. Well, Ivo didn't think of it. He made sure he was available to help whenever they needed it. That must have been a huge commitment. Yes, but he didn't seem to question that either. I think the family was in a state of crisis from the moment that Rosalie disappeared. They were fighting fires all the time. They didn't have time or space for introspection. What about this man who accosted Sabiha two weeks ago? Did Ivo tell you anything about him? Yes and no. He didn't get to talk to him. The guy ran away as soon as he caught sight of Ivo. He disappeared through the park. Ivo couldn't give me a proper description of him either. It was drizzling by the time he arrived, and the man had his hood up. But here's an interesting thing that I don't think Ivo clocked. He definitely recognised Ivo, because he took to his heels. Ivo could have been anyone walking down the street, but our mystery man knew exactly who he was and didn't want to hang around to chat. That fits with him asking Sabiha about the marshals by name. Maybe he wanted to talk to the parents, but he didn't fancy an argument with their grown-up son. If he recognised Ivo, presumably Ivo would have recognised him. Very possibly. And he didn't want to be recognised. I also thought that. Because he was up to no good. I think we can assume that was the case. So, we need to find this man. Any ideas? Not so far. He yawned. I'm trying to get hold of my mate who investigated Rosalie's disappearance. What about Magnus? 
I've left him some voicemails, but he hasn't replied. I never listened to your voicemails either. Did Ivo tell you anything useful about him? Magnus didn't help with the parents at all. He seemed to be no contact with the whole family. Ivo said Magnus went his own way. What does that mean? I think we'll have to ask Magnus that. Ask Magnus what? I almost dislocated something as I whipped around to face the man who was standing in the doorway. He was in his twenties, and fair, with the kind of thin skin that flushed easily. He looked enough like his brother that it didn't take much guesswork to identify him. But unlike his brother, he gave every impression of someone who didn't mind being rude at all. How did you get in here? Maeve, what's going on? Derwent sounded sharp and much too loud. I picked up my phone without taking my eyes off the younger Marshal's son. It's fine. I'll talk to you later. I thumbed the phone off without waiting for a reply, which I knew would earn me an earful of abuse at some point in the future, but I wanted to stop Magnus from heading for the door. Magnus? I'm Sergeant Maeve Kerrigan. I've been leaving you messages all day. Yeah, sorry about that. I didn't really listen to the messages, to be honest with you, once I got the gist. I thought I should come and see for myself what was going on. And the scene guard let you in? He was talking to the neighbours. Magnus tossed his hair off his forehead, with a jerk of his head that was pure arrogance. I didn't wait for him to notice me. Well, you're here now. You might as well talk to me here as anywhere else. Talk to you? About what? Um, your murdered parents? I settled for a polite smile. If you'd like to go into the sitting room, we can talk more easily in there. Where's that? He was looking around vaguely, as if he'd never seen the room or its contents before. Is this your first time here? I thought your parents had been living at this address for three years. He shrugged, his eyes as blank as a mannequin's. I never visited them, to be honest with you. I knew they'd moved out of the family home because Ivo emailed me on my work address to see if I wanted anything from it as a souvenir. And did you? Mate, I didn't even reply. I'm not your mate. I moved towards the door. The sitting room is on your right, past the kitchen. The kitchen, he repeated. Any chance of a cup of tea? I'm parched. Sorry, I said, not managing to sound sincere, but I won't keep you for too long. He prowled around the sitting room, peering out of the windows at the shadowy trees. Nice place. I couldn't tell if he was being sarcastic or not. Why did you avoid seeing your parents? Not just my parents, the whole family. I wanted a break from them. They were, what's the buzzword that therapists use? Toxic. In what way? He was crouching, turning the picture frame around to inspect the painting I'd found that morning. Jesus, look at that. I haven't seen this in years. I wonder why they kept it and nothing else. Who painted it? My nanny, believe it or not. He glanced at me with a wry expression that made me like him a fraction more. Sadie, her name was. Like the song. You mean the Beatles song? Sexy Sadie. I raised my eyebrows. And was she? He pretended to be horrified. I was a child. She was just the face I looked for in the crowd when I came out of school but I remember my mother saying it was appropriate. I was forming dark suspicions about why Sadie might have left. It's a pretty picture. He gave a bark of laughter. <laughs> it's shit, beautiful. You can call me Sergeant Kerrigan, I said, unmoved. I had worked with Derwent for too long to be flustered by someone calling me beautiful. Maybe they were sentimentally attached to the picture. 
Dad? Sentimentality is not his thing. Or it wasn't, I should say. Mum wouldn't have cared. He looked around, wrinkling his nose. There were decent paintings they might have kept. They had a Duncan Grant that was all right, and a very underwhelming Augustus John, but it would have been worth a bit. You sound as if you know your art. I studied it. Now I work for an auction house. That must be interesting, getting your hands on amazing paintings and treasures. He laughed. It's not Sotheby's. It's a small specialist outfit. You won't have heard of it. Rafe and Gunther. He was right. I hadn't heard of it. Ivo said your parents ran out of money. Presumably the paintings were sold. Not in the open market, I'd have known. But a discreet private sale, sure. As long as the dealer is respectable and the sale is recorded, it doesn't have to be turned into a song and dance. Why did you say your family was toxic? He sat down and slung one leg across the other. Back to that, are we? Well, it wasn't the ideal situation. Mum was a zombie. Dad was a benign dictator. Ivo was his loyal servant. Rosalie was the ghost that everyone pretended to ignore. I realized there was nothing in it for me. I just wanted to live my own life, make my own mistakes. What about Ivo? <laughs> he still wanted Dad's approval, Magnus snorted. The best way to get it was to walk away. Dad respected that. He didn't respect Ivo or his wife, Lisa. She's another doormat. She didn't mind Ivo being so attentive to them? He shrugged. She never said it to me. But she doesn't like me. And you don't like her. I don't think about her enough to have an opinion. When you heard that your parents were dead, what did you think? That he'd killed her and then himself. Was I wrong? I think you were. Not an accident. He read the answer in my face. Then... Someone did this to them. That's how it looks. How did they die? They suffocated your mother and shot your father while they were in bed. He got to his feet, his shock propulsive and unfeigned. Shot him? Where's the bedroom? You can't go in there. It's sealed in case there needs to be further forensic work. Anyway, it's not very pleasant. Did he own a handgun? Did he, bollocks? Magnus sneered. And then, as something occurred to him, his face dropped. At least, I don't know. An old Webley? Yes. Then, yes. I, I saw it once. It was in a box on top of a glass-fronted bookcase in Dad's study, and I thought it was a Christmas present. I climbed up and knocked the box down, which cracked the glass in the bookcase. No way to hide it. You must have been in trouble. I got the spanking of my life. I must have been ten, eleven, something like that. Was there ammunition with it? He closed his eyes, frowning. Um, y yes. I remember having to hunt around on the carpet for the bullets. I think there were six or seven. Where did he get it? He didn't tell me. It could have belonged to his father, though, I suppose. And who else would have known he had a gun? N no idea. Didn't Ivo come across it when he was helping them to move in here? He said not. Frank incredulity on Magnus's face. And you believed him? He seemed to be telling the truth. I was aware that I sounded uncertain. Well, that's Ivo's trick. People take him at face value and assume he's a good guy. Magnus shook his head slowly. 
but I'd have thought someone like you would know better. 14. Unhelpful to the last, Magnus declined the opportunity to help me carry some boxes of papers out to the car. He did confirm, with a quick look around the flat, that most of the furniture hadn't been in his family home. This stuff is grim. They had better taste than that. So everything was sold? I suppose so. Dad would have minded that a lot. I doubt Mum would have noticed or cared. But before she became ill, she was proud of the house. Did you know they had run out of money? They couldn't hide it. Dad gave up work to look after Mum. And they spent a fortune on doctors and the like. No holidays, no new cars, no presents at Christmas. Their standard of living plummeted. Was that why you decided there was no point in staying in touch with them? It was a rude question, but I was under no illusion that Magnus and I were ever going to be friends. No, it wasn't. I never wanted a penny from them, and I wouldn't have taken it if they'd offered it. He picked up his coat. I left the family because it was broken, and it was breaking me. They were selfish people and they got worse once they had an excuse to look for sympathy. Ivo seems to have felt some obligation to let them use him, but I didn't. They were adults, and they made their own choices. They didn't choose to lose Rosalie. He looked at me for a moment, his eyes cold. Didn't they? Do you think they were involved? I don't know. I've never known. He pulled the coat on. And now I suppose I'll never find out. The flat seemed to vibrate with his anger and distress long after he'd gone. He was an awkward and unhappy young man, I thought. And I could understand it if he truly suspected his parents had been involved in the disappearance of his little sister. I didn't quite believe Magnus when he said Ivo was a fraud, but I didn't dismiss it either. I'd met Ivo for an hour, less, in the aftermath of his parents' death, so I wasn't sure I'd seen him as he really was. Magnus, for all his younger brother truculence, had grown up with him, and I was used to people lying to me. Maybe Ivo's wide-eyed cooperation wasn't everything it had seemed to be. I stacked boxes in the hall, checking the contents so I had some idea of what I was taking back to the office. A whole archive of obsession. I'd calculated I could take seven boxes in my car, but that meant seven trips down the stairs and along the street to where I was parked. There weren't any spaces closer to the flat. I did three trips before I needed a break, not so much because I was tired but because the special constable on scene guard duty annoyed me. He was young, soft and red-faced, and seemed to feel he was entitled to comment on what I was doing every time I passed him. Got your hands full there, love. Put your back into it. Get it done in no time. What you need to do is put one under each arm. Half as many trips. You know, you could help, I snapped in the end. I've got a job to do here. Is that the job you were doing when you let the victim's son walk into the crime scene unannounced? I don't know what you're talking about. You were chatting to the neighbours. He looked wounded. I was reassuring them that they were safe. You don't know that they're safe. And I wasn't safe since you weren't doing the very basic job of watching who was entering the premises. It could have been anyone who walked past you. It could have been the killer. Magnus had caught me unawares, and I didn't like it. Sorry. He swallowed, his eyes wide. I thought he was about twenty-two, and now he was terrified. I went back into the flat for a glass of water and some much-needed time out. On the fourth trip, the special constable was silent as I stalked past him. It was a shame that I'd broken him, because although I didn't know it, I was about to need him. 
As I levered the main door open and stepped out into the night, I saw a man leaning into a car down the street, then straightening up to examine something he had retrieved from it. I took a moment to realize it was my car he had been searching, which meant that he had broken into it. My initial reaction was outrage. My second was interest. It wasn't my car, after all, but a job car, and he was peering at a file he had liberated from one of the boxes. He hadn't noticed me yet, and I took the opportunity to note every detail of his appearance. He had fine dark hair that was sparse on top and straggled over his collar, a weak jaw, thin limbs and sloping shoulders. Inoffensive was the word that occurred to me first, along with the suspicion that it was an image he cultivated. I guessed he was a journalist, getting a different angle on the double murder story that would merit a couple of paragraphs in the newspapers the following day. Una Burt believed in press releases that were low on detail and big on jargon, so even the most gothic crimes sounded tedious. If he'd worked out who the marshals were and their connection with Rosalie, this guy had already done better than most of his colleagues. Finding the family files on Rosalie's disappearance would be a major scoop. I put down the box I was holding and ducked back into the building, calling up the stairs to the constable. In as few words as possible, I explained to him about the man outside and that I needed him to secure the building at the front door. But I thought I was supposed to guard this crime scene. That's what you told me to do. And now I'm telling you to take charge of the building's security. What about you? Why can't you do it? Panic edged his words. I'm going to tackle the man who broke into my car. But he could be armed. If you're worried, call for backup, I hissed, thoroughly irritated. But I've dealt with worse. What if he's there as a distraction, and someone's real intention is to gain access to the crime scene while we're both engaged with him? This possibility had obviously not occurred to him. He goggled at me, silent. So, would you mind coming down to the hall and keeping an eye on the box of papers and the building and on me? I I'm not sure. He was fingering his radio nervously. I am. Get down here and do your job. My tone made him move at last. I slipped out of the front door of the building and across the road thanks to a helpful gap in the traffic. I walked briskly along the park railings, apparently lost in thought, actually focused on the man who was rifling through the car as if he was a terrier hunting for rats. At the next lull in the traffic, I crossed back and came up behind the man. Excuse me, sir, what are you doing? He gave a start, and everything he was holding cascaded to the ground. Files, a torch, a metal rod, and a screwdriver. The screwdriver rolled towards me, and I kicked it deftly under the car. Hey, that's mine. Is it? Is that the tool you used to break into my car? Are you admitting it's yours? I... N no, I, I... He fumbled his phone out of his pocket, and keyed in the code to unlock it at the second attempt, his hands shaking. Are you planning to record this conversation? I am, yes. He had managed to open the camera and had switched it to record video, but he was struggling with the record button. Not working? That's a shame. Let me see. I picked it out of his hand and dropped it, sending it after the screwdriver with a swift sideways shove. That's, that's mine too. My personal property. You can't do that. It was an accident, I said, my eyes wide with innocence. I'll get it back for you before we go to the Nick. To the... You mean you're going to arrest me? You broke into my car. I didn't. It was open. It certainly was not. I wobbled the window of the passenger door. And this wasn't loose when I left it. 
and you just admitted the tool I found was yours. Where did you learn to break into cars? Read it, the man said sulkily, and I was just doing research. Are you a journalist? In a way. I'm working on a podcast. Oh, I eyed him. About the marshals, by any chance? How did you know? You tracked them down. You approached their carer a couple of weeks ago. His jaw sagged. How did you know that? Intuition, I relented. And you fitted the description she gave me. What's your name? Tor Grant. His voice acquired a new resonance and confidence, as if I should be impressed. I remained underwhelmed. And you make podcasts? Yes. Well, this one. This is my first. It's going to make my reputation. People love this kind of unsolved mystery. He looked back over his shoulder at the building behind us. And now this has happened. I mean, what an opener. Bang. Bang, I repeated. Bang. Straight into the story. So he hadn't been making a reference to Bruce Marshall's death. Or he had, and he was covering up with his twit of the year routine. The thing is, podcasts about missing kids are ten a penny. That's what a producer told me. You need something extra, they all said. Some hook. I thought this case had it all, but everyone said it wasn't enough. Some of them said it was too long ago, and some of them said it was too recent. But now, this is current. It's exciting. It opens the whole story up. And they can't sue you for defamation now? N no, well, exactly. That occurred to me. They haven't even been dead for 24 hours. I couldn't keep the revulsion out of my voice. Oh, and I should wait, is that it? How long is respectful? A day? Two? A week? How did you even know about it? I was doing some recording. Children playing in the playground. Bird singing, that kind of thing. <laughs> Colour for the podcast. I saw the police cordon. And when you heard the marshals were dead, you decided you needed to kick your investigation up a notch. Other podcasters will be all over this. People with funding and sponsorship and big organisations behind them. Well, you're not going to get anything done tonight. I hooked my cuffs out of my jacket and snapped one on his right wrist without any warning. I'm arresting you. No! He flailed so I couldn't get hold of his left hand. You can't do this! Stop fighting me! I dodged to avoid getting an accidental elbow in the face. He wasn't athletic or coordinated, but he was lanky, and I couldn't pin him down easily if he was determined to be uncooperative. I'm not letting go. He threw his head back and yelled, Help! Police brutality! Help! There were areas of London where that would have drawn a crowd, all with phones out to record video that would travel the globe faster than a lie. In Battersea, on Prince of Wales Drive, the windows remained genteelly shut. I wrestled with him for a bit longer, increasingly irritated. I managed to get hold of his left arm, but I'd lost my grip on the hand I had already cuffed, and he was waving it around turning the cuffs with their solid central bar into a decent weapon. Stop it, you little fucker, I hissed. Peripherally aware of a car screeching to a halt in the middle of the road, hazards on, blue lights flashing. The backup summoned by the constable, I assumed. Right up until I recognised the figure coming around the car with a face like thunder. Without any preliminaries or noticeable effort, Derwent cuffed Tor Grant on the side of the head, spun him around, slammed him against the car hard enough to knock the breath out of his body, and hauled his wrists together so he could put the handcuffs on properly. While Grant was protesting about that, Derwent twisted to check on me. Are you okay? 
I could have got the handcuffs on him myself, I said, furious. His eyes narrowed. Not how it looked to me. I'm bleeding, Grant said faintly. Good, Derwent said, and manhandled him to his car, where he formally arrested the podcaster. I waited until he had gone through the caution and slammed the door on Grant. I am a police officer. I have plenty of experience of arresting people, and I didn't need your help. Derwent leaned against the car, ignoring the knocking and muffled shouting that was coming from the back seat. Yes, yes, and no. You didn't have a hope. Well, we'll never know. He jerked a thumb at the back seat of his car. Is this the person who interrupted you when you were talking to me? That was Magnus, the second son. I got rid of him. This is Tor Grant, the man who approached Sabiha. He says he's making a podcast about the marshals. I was arresting him because he broke into my car. His phone is under my car, along with a bit of kit he used to get the door open. Derwent went over and dropped to the ground. He reached under the car to retrieve them, sliding them over to me before he stood up, dusting his hands off. Stick him on for assault, as well as breaking into the car. It should only take you a couple of hours to process him. Then the paperwork. You'll be finished by midnight, probably. But I was moving the files, I protested. You're not going anywhere in that car. It needs to be recovered and repaired. So you might as well deal with this twat. Call a van to take the pair of you to the nearest Nick, and I'll take the boxes back myself. No, wait. Got somewhere better to be. His tone was irritating enough to bring me out in hives, but I tried very hard not to let it show. What if we need to interview him about the marshals? He's been hanging around, he bothered Sabiha, and now he's here trying to look through the evidence I was collecting. What if he's our killer? I don't want there to be any issue about me questioning him if he's separately charged with assaulting me. Derwent snorted. You think that is capable of killing? I think I don't want to assume he isn't, I said evenly. Look, hand him over to the local CID once you get him booked in. I'll call their skipper and let them know. They can interview him about the car and the assault. At the moment, I just want him out of the way. They can drop the assault charge in the morning. You're not really hurt, are you? Parts of me were aching, and I knew I'd feel worse in the morning. But I shook my head. And the car's a job one, so that doesn't matter much either. No, like me, it doesn't matter at all. He gave me a reproving look. Come on, Maeve. Self-pity isn't your style. It was when I actually did feel sorry for myself, but I didn't argue with him. I went in the van with Tor Grant to the nearest police station, where the custody skipper was reluctant to accommodate an unexpected detainee, and the detectives were obviously irritated to have to interview him. None of this was my idea, I wanted to say, and didn't. And Tor Grant slipped through the system with all the ease of a brick on a sandpaper slide. 15. I came out of the police station and headed with purpose for the nearest taxi rank, focused on getting home. My phone buzzed against my hip. I hooked it out of my pocket, knowing who was calling before I looked. Josh. Maeve. He had used exactly the same measured tone of voice as me, and I grinned to myself. How was the nick? I've just left, actually. I know. I stopped walking. Are you here? A car horn tooted softly across the road, and I scanned the cars until I spotted a familiar one. Why are you here? Not the warm and welcoming reaction I was looking for. It's just, don't you want to go home? It's three in the morning. I yawned widely enough to crack my jaw. 
Christ, I've seen sharks with a less intimidating bite. I needn't have worried about you being mugged. Is that why? His car window was closed, and the streetlight was reflecting off it so I couldn't see him. You were worried about me? Just checking up on you. You did get a bit of a going over from Grant. Oh, I was surprised and warmed by his thoughtfulness. I took the boxes from your car back to the office. Then I thought I'd come back to see how you were getting on. I didn't think you'd be out for a while. Only the six hours this time. I was lucky. I'm going to get a taxi home. I'll drive you. It's completely the wrong direction for you. I know where it is. He sounded amused. It was his flat, after all, and I was only renting it from him. Are you sure? Maeve, get into the car. He ended the call. I ran across the road, caught between embarrassment and a sudden unexpected happiness that I didn't choose to analyse too closely. Well? Well what? The first couple of minutes of the journey had passed in silence, and I was relaxed, almost sleepy, my body slack against the seat. Derwent's question made me literally sit up. Did Tor Grant say anything interesting? What was he looking for in the boxes? He didn't say specifically. He said it was too good an opportunity to pass up. I yawned. He said a lot of other things. I don't think the detectives could have shut him up if they'd tried. Did he talk about the marshals? He talked about the podcast a lot. I did some sums and came up with not enough sleep. But all the same... Should I go and interview him about the marshals in the morning after they let him go? There are other things that are more important at this stage. I'll tell CID to make sure we know where we can find him. But if you're wondering if he killed them, I'd say no. Why would he? To generate interest in his podcast? Derwent shook his head. He's the sort of true crime fanatic who loves to talk about it but he would shit his pants if he met an actual killer. I mean, you scared the living daylights out of him, and you're hardly intimidating. Excuse me, I'm terrifying when I want to be. He grinned, concentrating on the road. If you say so. You had hours hanging around there doing nothing. You'll have spent some of that time thinking about the case, if I know you. Did you have any other thoughts? I had spent a fair amount of time thinking about Melissa and what she had said to Una Bert about us, but it would have taken serious torture for me to admit that to anyone, let alone Derwent. The scrap of paper I found down the side of Bruce's chair bothers me. Go on. It must have been something he wanted to remember, and presumably the shorthand made sense to him. BDK has to mean something and it relates to an important date. Maybe when Rosalie went missing? So? So what if he was aware that he was developing dementia? What if it was a reminder to him to look up the date his daughter disappeared? And the shock of forgetting such an important event pushed him into taking action? By killing his wife? Yeah, that's what I meant. He was frowning. We ruled it out because of the way the bodies were lying. I know, but I was wondering if we saw what we wanted to see. I said it in a small voice and got a swift glance from Derwent. You think it suits me to make this into a bigger case than it seemed at first? Why? Um, I squirmed. You don't like being told what to do? And this is one way of getting around Una Burt's rule about us not working together. You said as much yourself. You came up with the idea of it being a third-party murder rather than a murder-suicide. And at the time, you didn't know what Una had decided or why. I know. He was driving smoothly, untroubled. It worked out for me, don't get me wrong but I think there were enough issues with this case to trigger a proper investigation, not least the daughter's disappearance. 
I don't think we're overreacting. It worked out for me. What did that mean? Nothing romantic. He had literally stepped away from that when he'd had the opportunity the previous summer. And I closed my eyes for a moment to allow a wave of scalding shame to pass over me at the memory of how I had waited, expectant for him to kiss me. What had I been thinking? What are you thinking? I jumped, but managed to come up with, was it very convenient that Ivo invited Mr. Hood to visit, so he would be technically out of the way? Suspicious of you? Well, Magnus has been filling my head with doubts about his brother. Apparently, I wasn't anything like wary enough when I interviewed him. What's he like? He's charming. Very handsome. Derwent made a noise that was somewhere between a huff and a snort. I'm joking. He was a spoilt brat. His shoulders lowered a fraction. That's a surprise. He wasn't in touch with his parents and didn't seem bothered that they were dead. He said the painting of the old house was done by the nanny, Sadie, and it was almost the only thing they kept from the old days. Presumably Bruce decided to keep it. Helena had checked out, remember? Helena used to say Sexy Sadie was an appropriate nickname for the nanny. Did she? Derwent looked thoughtful. Maybe we should try to find this Sadie. Yes, that should definitely be a key objective at this stage of the investigation. It's all part of the picture of what happened before Rosalie disappeared. Sadie would be, what, 40 now? I'm betting still fit. What else do we need to do? Get the results of the post-mortems from Dr. Early. You and I can collect the last boxes from the flat and I need to talk to Billy Howlett, who ran the initial investigation into Rosalie's disappearance. He's retired now. What was he like? Painstaking. The sort of person who wouldn't like giving up on the investigation when he had to hand it over to someone else. Quiet, but you wouldn't want to get on the wrong side of him. Is he still alive? I'd have heard if he died, I think. Someone would have let me know. Derwent shook his head. Those messages about all the old bosses dying off. I never get used to them. And one day it'll be you. Derwent squinted out through the windscreen. Long walk home from here. I didn't say it would be soon, I protested. Better not. We bickered gently all the way through central London and out the other side to the flat where I lived. A first floor, one bedroom place where Derwent had spent some wild years, I suspected. It was on the corner of a pretty Victorian street of similar masonettes, mostly owned by house-proud yuppies, and it was within walking distance of nice shops and the underground station. He had renovated it beautifully, and even though I'd almost died in it, I liked it a lot. After years of moving in with boyfriends, and out again when the relationship ended, and a succession of grim rental properties, I thought of it as home. In fact, the only problem with it was the lack of on-street parking. When we turned into the street, Derwent stopped in the middle of the road with the hazards on. I pointed. There's actually a space on the left. Look, I never get that lucky. He hesitated. I was just going to drop you off. And what? Drive back to Sutton? He was living a long way south of the river, not far from where I'd grown up, and my parents still lived, so close, in fact, that they looked after Melissa's son Thomas from time to time. It's hardly worth it. If we're going to Battersea together in a few hours, we might as well start from here. I'm heading back to the office. I can sleep there. I've got a toothbrush and a change of clothes. I can lend you a toothbrush. You can have the sofa. I nudged him. I'll even let you use the washing machine if you ask nicely. The quick cycle has saved me from a laundry crisis more than once. Better not. He said it with the kind of decision that I recognised. He'd made up his mind. 
and I shouldn't have pushed further, but I found myself saying what came into my head. Because you'd get in trouble with Melissa for staying with me. A glower. Because it's not a good idea. And that was all I was getting. I put a hand on the door handle. Are you picking me up in the morning? No, I'll see you at the flat in Battersea at nine. He revved the engine. Go on, see what some beauty sleep can do for you. Nothing much, I imagine. I was hurt and embarrassed, but trying not to show it. If I'd got a taxi home, I would have had to make my own way to Battersea too, but somehow this was different. I got out, thanked him and closed the car door. He waited while I took out my keys and let myself into the flat, which was exactly the kind of thing he would do in case I was murdered on my doorstep and he missed it. Then he drove off with a brief wave. What else had I expected? I trudged up the stairs, feeling lonely for the first time in a long time. All very well for him to blame Una Bert, but I had a suspicion that wasn't the whole story. Derwent had been avoiding me for his own reasons. I just didn't know what they were. 16. Derwent had told me to be at the flat in Battersea at 9, which meant he would be there by 8.45 at the latest. I arrived 10 minutes before that, with two coffees and two bacon sandwiches. I leaned against the railings, enjoying the morning air, and the bird song from the park, and the feeling of superiority that came from being on time. I'd put some colour in my cheeks with the help of the blusher my mother had given me for Christmas, along with a meaningful look. I was feeling surprisingly well, which was adrenaline, and also anticipation. The thought tripped me up. Anticipation of what? Spending the day with Derwent, came the truthful answer, which was pathetic. Oh, yes, and what if he rings you to tell you he's not coming, and you can handle clearing out the flat on your own? Needled a mean little voice in my head. What if he's thought better of spending time with you, like he did last night? I wouldn't mind, I thought, knowing it was a lie. I took out my phone to check that I hadn't missed the soft hum of a message delivering bad news, so I was staring at the screen, like a teenager with a crush, the mean voice observed, when he strolled up, his hands in his pockets. What's this? Breakfast. I handed him his coffee and sandwich. Lifesaver. I thought we'd need it. I watched him wolfing the food down. He had shaved with care and his suit was immaculate, but nothing could hide that he was hollow-eyed with fatigue. How are you feeling? He said it around a mouthful of sandwich. Perfunctory, that was the word. Fine. How did you sleep? A grimace. I managed a couple of hours on the sofa in the break room. Well, you did have an alternative. Keep it normal, keep it light. I wanted to see how he would react, so I could work out how he really felt about what had happened, and by extension, how he felt about me. He ate the last of the sandwich and looked at me. Are you nearly finished? Not yet. Well, do you mind getting on with it? I just don't eat like a starving Labrador. Oh, sure. You're too much of a lady for that. Unless you're really hungry, in which case all bets are off. He sounded as if he was thinking about something completely different. Any news on Tor Grant? They've let him go. They got an address for us. It'll be a shame if he turns out to be our killer after all. I said it as a joke, but Derwent looked gloomy. That could still happen. Is it the lack of sleep, Josh? Or is something else making you grumpy? Instead of answering, he walked away towards the building. I scrambled to gather up the empty cups and the remains of my breakfast, then dropped the lot in the bin on my way. He was holding the door open for me, which was something. I waited in the hallway, 
letting him take the lead. All the little tricks were coming back to me. The techniques I had learned to deal with him in the years when he was relentlessly rude and confrontational. Nothing to do with me or something I'd done. My thoughts were interrupted by a door opening as we started up the stairs. You there. Are you the police? A big man, stooping over a stick. He had a white beard and white hair, which gave him an immediate touch of the old St. Nick's. But the red in his face was high blood pressure rather than jolliness. Derwent came back down two steps. Yes, sir. What can we do for you? I wanted to complain about the noise. We're conducting a murder investigation, sir. Unfortunately, it does involve a certain amount of coming and going. The man was oblivious to the tone of reproach that Derwent reserved for members of the public who had transgressed. It's been intolerable. You're right over our heads, you know. People dropping things, dragging things, tramping around on the balcony. Totally inconsiderate. Sorry about that, Derwent said, not sounding it. We'll be finishing up shortly. I hope so. Can't concentrate on the wireless. You must have very good hearing, I said, and he threw back his head like an old elephant. Got these new hearing aids. Didn't want them, but they talked me into it. Now I can hear everything. Marvellous. He turned to face away from us, and I thought he was going back into his flat, but he barked, Say something quietly, and I'll tell you what it was. Not even looking. Go on. I didn't dare catch Derwent's eye. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. How I wonder what you are, he finished, triumphant, working his way back around. You see, I leave them in because they're fiddly little things, so sometimes I get woken up during the night. Did that happen the night before last? I asked. Early yesterday morning. He shook his head, irritable. That was it. I was wide awake. What time? Five, it must have been. Do you know what woke you? Could it have been a gunshot? He considered the question. No. Thumping and banging. From eight or so, there was a lot of coming and going, which was you lot. To Derwent, I said quietly, Kev mentioned that he got in trouble for making too much noise on the balcony. That's the worst place for it, the man said. Sounds like a herd of bullocks trampling around. Could I ask your name, sir? I asked. Hartley Goring. I'm in flat three. Mr. Goring... Did you ever hear anything that was unusual or suspicious from upstairs? Arguments? Odd sounds? They were good neighbours, until recently. Their son, he dropped in once. I had a leak. Thought it was coming from their flat. He came and found out what was wrong. Nothing to do with them, as it happened. Was that Ivo? Nice young lad. Mr. Goring was leaning more heavily on his stick, as if standing was an effort. Well, that's all I had to say. About the noise. We'll keep it in mind, Derwent said smoothly. And I do apologize. Is it possible to adjust your hearing aids? Yes, I, I suppose it is. Maybe turn them down a little for the next hour. We'll be moving boxes around. But this should be the last of it, I added. Mr. Goring looked unimpressed, but he tapped away down the hall. Derwent was grinning when I turned back to him. Twinkle, twinkle. It was the first thing that came into my head. I wonder why. Don't overthink it, I said, following him up the stairs. What would you have said? Not that. I dropped my voice so it was a mumble, barely audible. Mr. Goring didn't hear a shot. 
Maybe the killer used something to muffle the sound, Derwent murmured back. I frowned. We didn't find anything. No, he could have taken it with him. Derwent leaned closer. Or the hearing aids might not be as good as all that. You're still whispering, I pointed out. Better safe than sorry. He let us into the empty flat. The living room felt cold and abandoned. We spent a few minutes in the main bedroom, which was marginally better without the bodies and bloodied bed linen, but found nothing that could have muffled the shot. It would have been covered in blood. Maybe Kev took it, Derwent said at last. The killer would have had to hold it over Bruce's face, wouldn't he? Risky unless he was sure neither of them was going to wake up because they were unconscious. If they were unconscious, it needn't have been a man. I sighed. We're making the wrong kind of progress. Adding suspects instead of eliminating them, Derwent grimaced. I keep waiting for it all to fall into place, but it doesn't. Who would want to kill them? Why now? What if it has nothing to do with Rosalie and we're barking up the wrong tree? That's the job, isn't it? Trying all the trees until you find the right one. That's life. He leaned against the wall, his head tilted back. A troublemaking stance if ever I saw one. Speaking of which, are you seeing anyone at the moment? I blinked at the change of topic. Like, like your ex. My ex, Rob, who had resurfaced briefly after years of silence. He's long gone. How do you feel about that? Fine. I feel fine. And you shouldn't ask me about him. Or this. It's not appropriate. Keep your hair on, I'm just saying. Well, don't. He peeled himself away from the wall and went into the second bedroom, whistling which meant he was pleased with himself. I wondered why I'd been looking forward to spending the day with him and took a second to retrieve my self-possession. I spent it looking at the windows which had been open, but that Sabiha had sworn were usually closed. No one could have come in or gone out that way, but I kept worrying at it. Whether it was relevant or not, it was different and that made me suspicious. I found Derwent shifting boxes, moving them into the hall. I'm organising them by weight. The ones nearest the door are the lightest. You can carry them down to the car. Leave the ones on the right to me. I can manage. Okay. He dumped the box he was carrying into my arms, and unprepared, I almost dropped it. I eased it down. Fine, you've made your point. Of course, I still see you as my equal, blah, blah, blah. He grinned at me and went back into the bedroom. A long scuffing sound as he dragged a box from one side of the room to the other made me wince. Mr. Goring wouldn't like that at all. I was just lifting one of the lighter boxes when he spoke. Maeve, could you come here? What have you got? I looked through the doorway and found him hovering over the last row of boxes by the window, balancing on one foot. I think we fucked up. What? What do you mean? I went to stand next to him, and he put his arm out to stop me from touching the boxes. Who's been in here? You, me, Liv, Kev and his crew, Magnus, the son? I, I don't know who else. Why? Someone was here. He had taken a torch out and was playing it over the space behind the boxes. I braced myself on his shoulder and looked. A rust-coloured piece of fabric stuck out from behind the last boxes, and there was a smear of the same colour along the wall. Derwent swore quietly. That'll be whatever was used to muffle the shot. 
in case you were in any doubt that this was connected with the murders. I looked at the window for the first time, noticing that it looked out on the balcony. Is the window unlocked? Looks like it. Come on. Derwent hurried around to the living room, where he opened the door, and peered out along the balcony. Shit. What is it? An easy drop down to street level. You'd have to be fit, but not exceptionally so. You could do it. Oh, well, in that case. I looked, though, and was inclined to agree with him. So, our killer came and went through the window. Colin can stop wasting time looking at CCTV from inside the building. Those noises Mr. Goring heard on the balcony. That would be our guy leaving. At least we know how he got out, and we have some idea of when he left. But we don't know when he arrived, or how he got in. And we've obliterated any worthwhile forensic evidence in the second bedroom and the balcony. Derwent clasped his hands behind his head and walked around in a small, frustrated circle. Apart from that, we're doing a great job. 17. One small thing went our way. William Howlett hadn't moved far from London when he retired. His house was in rural Sussex, a small 1960s bungalow on a tree-lined country lane, with a view of rolling hills dressed in sharp spring green. He was outside when we arrived, raking the grass. A slight, grey-haired man, who had wiry strength in abundance, and who wanted, passionately, for us to leave him alone. It's good to see you, Derwent said with feeling. And the two men shook hands, holding on marginally longer than I would have expected. Mutual respect, I gathered, or a test of strength. Impossible to tell who had won. You too, Josh. Inspector now? Howlett shook his head. How on earth did you manage that? Wrong place, wrong time. This is my colleague, Sergeant Kerrigan. Ah, he nodded to me. An understated man, Derwent had told me in the car on the way there. Old school, but he's not old. He would have been the type who joined young and did his thirty and retired to enjoy the pension while he was in his fifties. Don't make the mistake of thinking he was a card index kind of detective. He retired in 2016. He's barely middle-aged, and you're still young. Got it, I said. So I shouldn't expect him to be a sexist dinosaur. I don't know. That attitude runs deep, doesn't it? I seem to remember his team was mostly blokes, apart from the civilian staff. He wasn't married, except to the job. He looked across at me. Basically, I'll do the talking. Now, I stood a pace behind Derwent, letting him take the lead. As I said on the phone, it's regarding Rosalie Marshall. I always expected that one would come back to haunt me. I have to say, I didn't anticipate it would be because her parents were murdered. He had a quiet voice just above a mumble and a distracted manner, which I thought had probably misled more than a few criminals in his time. There's no doubt about that, I suppose. They were both murdered. No doubt at all. Not now that we had found the cushion used to muffle the gun. That's a shame. A very great shame. He dusted off his hands. Come into the house. I'll make tea. The kitchen was small, but very clean, and looked modern, with a polka-dotted blind at the window, and shiny red cupboards that didn't seem to fit with what I knew of Howlett. It was a happy space, light-hearted. Do you live here on your own? I asked. Uh, no, with my wife. I'm sorry she's not here, but she's out volunteering at the local school this morning. When did you get married? Derwent was looking startled. A couple of years ago. 
I thought I'd never marry. Then I met Sheila. He smiled, and I saw the warmth that had been missing from his manner before. Never too late to be happy. Good for you. Derwent clapped him on the shoulder. And are you married, Josh? Not yet. There was an odd undertone to his voice. Marry Melissa. I hadn't even thought of that. I'd been so sure that Derwent wasn't happy with her. Just like every other woman since the dawn of time, the mean voice in my head informed me. Not that you've made it to other woman status. Maybe I only saw what I wanted to see. I tuned out of the do you remember conversation that Derwent and Howlett were having, following in silence as the retired superintendent put mugs on a tray and carried them into a sunny living room. A wedding photograph stood on a side table. Howlett in a suit with a rose pinned to his lapel, smiling widely as he held hands with the beaming, dark-haired woman in pale pink. The picture was a million miles away from misery and missing children, and I understood why Bill Howlett had picked a time when his wife would be out, and why he had chosen to put off talking about the marshals until he couldn't avoid it any longer. Howlett sat in an armchair that looked comfortably worn, crossing his legs and holding his hands up in front of his mouth, the fingers interlaced. Why don't you begin? In a few brief sentences, Derwent outlined what had happened. The bodies, the causes of death, the room full of boxes, and the balcony. Our current assumption is that it was something to do with Rosalie's disappearance. There doesn't seem to be any other reason why two frail and elderly people would be murdered in their beds. You've ruled out burglary. He murmured it as if it was hardly worth floating the idea. The pathologist thinks they were drugged with chloroform before they were killed, which is unusual for a burglary. And they didn't have many possessions any more, I said. There was nothing to steal. Interesting. Chloroform? They're doing more tests, but it looks like it. The pathologist said it's easy enough to make it if you know how. Hmm. They were well off, you know, when I knew them. At least that was how it looked to an outsider like me. Big house, staff, the kids went to private schools, and no one had a real job. What did the sons say about that? The same. The parents had run out of money. Nothing to inherit, Derwent said. Nothing to fight over. I smiled. Magnus could start a fight in an empty room. That's also interesting, Howlett said. He was a nice boy. A little wild, perhaps. He was devastated when his little sister disappeared. And Ivo? He was older, of course. A teenager. He was more closed off, but certainly upset. Derwent leaned forward his elbows on his knees. You got the first impression of the case before the waters got too muddy to be able to see anything. You must have had your own theories about what happened. Howlett considered it for a moment. Well, you know how she disappeared. A cool August night. No windows left open downstairs. No doors unlocked according to the marshals. No sign of a break-in. Helena Marshall was first to get up that morning and went downstairs without checking on Rosalie, though she did visit the bedrooms of her other two children. They were asleep. Why did she leave Rosalie out? Derwent asked. She didn't want to wake her up, he shrugged. Nothing to say that was a lie. Rosalie was usually the first one down in the morning, everyone agreed. And sometimes she would make herself breakfast. But on this particular morning, there was no sign that anyone had been up already, except for marks on the back door that Helena claimed to have seen. 
the door itself was open. You said the doors were all locked? Exactly. Howlett smiled at me. That's what Helena and Bruce told me. When she came down, Helena assumed someone had opened the door again after she had gone to bed and had forgotten to lock it. She shut it, then cleaned the door, then couldn't find the key. There was no damage to the door. Bruce said he had locked and bolted the door at the top and bottom before he went to bed. Someone unbolted it at some stage, and we never found the key. Someone who was inside the house. Could Rosalie have done it? Derwent asked. She couldn't have reached the bolt at the top of the door, even if she'd been standing on a chair. So, do you think that's how she left the house? Possibly. Or one of the boys opened the door and wouldn't admit it in case they got in trouble. One theory was that she climbed out of her bedroom window, or someone climbed in. The window was loose, and it was possible to rattle it in its frame and dislodge the lock. I did it myself to test it. Was her bedroom disturbed? She spent some time in her bed, from the way the bedclothes were left. Nothing was particularly out of place, but then there wasn't much to be out of place. It was bare, I remember that. Very little that a child would love. Some books, a couple of toys. He stared into space, and I knew he was back in that room. Then, of course, there was the blood on the floor. Blood? Derwent and I said at the same time. Yes, not much, a few drops. But it came back as Rosalie's when we tested it. Now, it wasn't fresh, it had been there a while. Helena claimed that she had scraped herself on something, and it wasn't unusual for her to have cuts and bruises. She said she was a clumsy child. If a parent said that to me in an investigation, I'd think it was a red flag, I said. Indeed. Howlett's voice was quiet, but the way he spoke, slowly, halfway to a drawl, made me sit up and mind my manners. I noticed Derwent was smirking to himself. I didn't take it for granted that she was telling the truth. But I spoke to a lot of people who knew Rosalie. Teachers, her nanny, her siblings. And they all agreed that Rosalie was careless and dreamy. She was one of those kids who wants to climb trees but falls out of them. No sense and no idea of what her limits might be. She sounds brilliant. Derwent said, and Howlett smiled. By the end of my time on the investigation, I felt as if I knew her. She was bright and imaginative and fun. Her classmates were devastated when they heard she was missing. Her teacher cried. What about her nanny? I asked. Howlett paused. That was a different situation. The nanny's name was Sadie Pilchrist. She was 24, and she was absolutely furious with the marshals, who had sacked her a couple of weeks earlier. I had to take that resentment into account when I considered what she told me, especially where it didn't match up with what other witnesses alleged. Derwent looked at me, triumphant. I told you the nanny was important. I unclenched my jaw to ask, did you discount her evidence because she was a young woman? I didn't discount it at all, but I'm afraid I didn't weigh it as heavily as the evidence from the family doctor, for example. Dr. Fuller. Sadie Pilchrist alleged that Helena occasionally administered physical punishments to Rosalie when she was angry with her. A slap, a spanking, that kind of thing. But I couldn't find anyone to corroborate it. Dr. Fuller had never noticed anything out of the ordinary with Rosalie. She'd had concussion, that happened at school, and a broken wrist that she got playing football. But also the usual childhood ailments, chicken pox and chest infections and so forth. Dr. Fuller was horrified when I asked about violence in the home, 
but couldn't recall any evidence to support the allegation. And the boys flat out denied it. They might not have said anything if they were scared of Helena too, I protested. Sadie was almost certainly sleeping with Bruce Marshall. And she was sacked after the family holiday that year in France, Howlett said, with the air of someone playing a winning hand. She wouldn't admit it to me, and Bruce denied it. But the boys both told me. Halfway through the holiday, there was a huge argument between the adults, and Sadie cried a lot, and then she went home. After that, Helena was doing all the childcare. Were Bruce and Helena getting on then, at the time Rosalie disappeared? He grimaced at Derwent. They had patched things up, but no. I'd say there was little love and no trust between them. They supported each other during the investigation, and then Helena overdosed, and after that she was totally dependent on him. Was Sadie ever a suspect in Rosalie's disappearance? Derwent asked. She had an alibi for the night in question. If she had wanted revenge on Helena, I think she would have gone to the papers and revealed what she was like behind closed doors. Helena was just famous enough for them to have done a story about it. She didn't need Rosalie to be missing. Why didn't she do a tell-all after Rosalie disappeared? I asked. It seemed like an obvious earner for her in the circumstances. She did. They got it spiked. The marshal spent a fortune on lawyers. Every newspaper editor in London had a solicitor's letter at one point or another. If you ruled out the nanny, who did you rule in? Derwent sat back, strictly off the record. One of the problems we had was the sheer volume of people who were suspects. Helena was a divisive figure. She had death threats before and after Rosalie's disappearance. Bruce had business interests that annoyed animal rights campaigners. Investigating that took up a huge amount of time and money, and it got us nowhere. They had anonymous letters. I mean, you always will in a case like this. But it was on a scale that I hadn't experienced before. And phone calls. It drove Helena over the edge. That's what caused her to try to end her life. I assumed so. Howlett looked at me, his eyes shrewd behind the thick lenses. I never knew for certain. Who else was a suspect? Easier to tell you who wasn't. The house was full of people in the weeks before she disappeared. Strangers, neighbours, friends of the family. Someone saw a strange car outside a number of times, but we never got a proper description or number plate. Any one of them could have taken the key to the back door and then let themselves in at their leisure. The door was bolted, but the kidnapper could have been in the house already that evening, hiding. Or they could have been in the house already because they lived there, Derwent said and Howlett nodded. It's possible. What about Rosalie's birth family? I asked. Her parents were both dead. George Canning, his name was, and the wife was Sarah. George was a painter. An artist, not houses. They were very young. Seventeen when she got pregnant with Rosalie. Twenty-one when George killed Sarah. Jesus. Derwent flinched. He was mentally ill. Schizophrenic, they thought. But he hanged himself on remand, and so he never had a formal diagnosis. There was no warning. They lived in a tiny little cottage somewhere in Cornwall, in absolute poverty. And Sarah didn't tell anyone that he was unstable. I don't think they had a phone, even. She did little bits of work here and there. Cleaning, I think. And looking after children. He sighed. We did wonder if it was a family member who'd taken Rosalie when she disappeared, but they were totally uninterested in her. She was in a foster family for a couple of years before Helena made contact with them. Rosie Canning became Rosalie Marshall when she was five years old, and she disappeared when she was nine, 
and her birth family didn't see her from the day she went into care until she disappeared. Six years, no contact, their choice. How did the marshals get to adopt her? Helena was involved with a charity, some sort of religious organisation. She wanted a little girl, not a baby, because a baby was too much work, and she jumped the queue to adopt Rosalie. She was quite candid about it with me. She had a list of criteria, and Rosalie met all of them. No living parents, intelligent, a girl of school-going age, but young enough to be malleable. Was that the word she used? Howlett nodded. The distaste on his face mirrored on Derwent's. She didn't waste a lot of time finding out about the birth parents. I think she didn't want to know much about them. Helena was never very interested in anyone but Helena. Mr. Howlett, what do you think happened to Rosalie? I asked. I think someone took her and put her in the river. We never found a trace of her. Not a footprint, not a hair. It was just at the bottom of the garden. I saw the river that first morning, and I knew she was already dead. He took off his glasses and polished them on his shirt, absent-mindedly. His eyes looked vulnerable without them, defenceless. I looked for that child every day for a year. In some ways, I've never stopped. On the doorstep, he said, I don't talk to my wife about the cases. She doesn't need to know everything that keeps me awake at night. Derwent nodded. They never leave you alone, do they? The ones that didn't work out especially. Part of the job, Howlett said soberly. You'll take them with you when you go. And it's not always the ones you'd expect that cause the most pain. Eighteen. Bruce. Daddy. Daddy. Bruce folded his arms more tightly across his chest. He was leaning back in his padded desk chair, congratulating himself, not for the first time, on establishing that he needed an office at home, and that the furnishing of the office must be left to him. He had spent a lot of time and a considerable amount of money on the oxblood leather chair that had made Helena shudder. It's vile. It's comfortable. For my back, Bruce had added quickly, thinking, for my naps and it had proved to be a loyal companion when he was in his study, reading papers and making calls. Bruce did, of course, make calls, but they were largely to friends to arrange golf outings, which counted as work because that was how he made the right impression on the right people, who then invited him to be on the right boards and chair the right committees. He had a carefully cultivated reputation for being reasonable, and not asking the difficult questions that could derail ambitious business plans. He didn't like to look the gift horses in the mouth too closely, not with two sons in private school, and every prospect that little Rosalie would be the same. Even though he had tried hinting to Helena that it wasn't quite as important for her, it wasn't that she was adopted and therefore didn't deserve the expenditure, he had explained, but more that, the boys needed to meet the right people, and through them, Rosalie would meet the right people. Helena had been furious. It's a hostage to fortune, and every journalist will ask me about it quite rightly. Do you want me to look like a fool? So he'd backed off, but he hadn't given up. Bruce was a practical man, and he didn't feel that girls repaid their education in the way that a son might. They had other things to offer. He cherished a vision of himself walking rosily down the aisle, her face obscured with a cloud of white lace, which was convenient because, try as he might, 
he couldn't imagine her looking like anything other than a black-eyed urchin. Daddy? Daddy? She was sitting outside the closed door to the study, and she would sit there until the door opened, or Helena found her and shooed her away. She was quiet enough, just that insistent repetition of daddy every few seconds, which was enough to drive a less patient man insane. Every so often, a piece of paper would slide slowly under the door, with a scuffing sound that always seemed sinister. My story, Rosalie would tell him, or a letter to you, Daddy, or a drawing I just wanted to do, and I think it's quite like what I imagined. He rarely looked at them properly, truth be told. Little grubby scraps of paper went on the fire when it was lit, and in a drawer when it was the summer. He appreciated it, in a way. No matter what he gave Ivo and Magnus, it was the wrong thing. The wrong brand of cricket bat, the wrong type of trainers, the wrong game for their infernal computers. But throw a box of crayons in Rosalie's direction, and her peaky little face lit up as if he'd given her diamonds and rubies. A shout came from outside, somewhere in the garden. He swivelled in the chair to look out of the window. There, Ivo, running backwards in defiance of gravity and wisdom, all his focus on the cricket ball that was arcing towards him. There was a lovely inevitability in the way the ball curved into Ivo's outstretched palms, a pure moment of grace as he took it from the air. But he'd had to hustle to get it. Oh, well done. Bruce murmured, imagining himself at Lord's on a sunny day. I say. Good, that's it. Back to me. Ivo lobbed the ball back to the trainer, who remained invisible behind the shrubbery. Trainer was a grand word for the boy, Nathaniel, only a few years older than Ivo, but prodigiously talented. He had come up through the cricket club's outreach scheme, and he needed the money, the coach had told Bruce. Nathaniel was lined up to go on a cricket tour to South Africa in the winter, so he was spending his summer training Ivo and boys like him, giving them one-to-one -one attention for a very reasonable hourly rate. And Ivo was improving, Bruce thought. Decent fielding, excellent batting. Not an all-rounder, unlike Nathaniel, but you hardly ever got that. He'd put in the hours down at the nets, dogged and determined. And that was Ivo for you. He'd break his heart, striving to be excellent before he'd admit defeat. Whereas Magnus... Daddy, please, Daddy, I want to show you my story. Rosalie, Daddy's working, Bruce barked, sounding more annoyed than he really was. She wouldn't dare to open the door, and he was managing to ignore her quite well. And there was Ivo again, racing to an imaginary boundary. He was good, Bruce thought, and he could be even better. And Lord's wasn't an impossible dream. It had to happen for some parents. Why not him? Why not me was the philosophy that had taken him this far through life. It was a useful means of eliminating self-doubt if you were weighing up whether to go for a job or not. And it was a very good way to avoid the nagging concern that you'd gone a long way on privilege alone. Would he have achieved as much if his parents hadn't been wealthy? Perhaps not. But since he couldn't do anything to change that, why not enjoy the benefits? The guilt wasn't his when it was sheer luck that he'd been born in the right circumstances. Everyone was entitled to ride their luck. Daddy, when will you be finished work? Daddy? Daddy? She sounded as if she was close to tears, and Bruce clenched his fists in irritation. Not for some time, darling. Go and play. I did play, and I did writing. Now I want to show you. It's about Medusa, 
with the snakes from my book. She was obsessed with the book he had given her on Greek and Roman myths, something he'd seen in a bookshop window and picked up on a whim. Magnus had given up on it after flicking through the pictures, and Helena had told him it was too old for Rosalie, but she had fallen in love with it. She had read it for weeks now, lying on the landing on her front, breathing heavily as she worked her way through the stories, lost in other worlds. It had led to awkward questions about Lida and Zeus, and what exactly he had done when he was pretending to be a swan. Bruce tried to remember the story of Medusa. Pretty much sex-free, he thought. Like his marriage. Better not think about that. Go and show mummy. Bruce pulled a face at his own audacity. This was the dance that two working parents did, even when they were both working at home. Working. That was what Helena called it, but it was largely writing long screeds for her blog, horrible word, and going on the radio, and allowing herself to be interviewed, and writing important articles for the broadsheets about parenting adopted children. Well, she could try parenting the one she had. That would be a start, Bruce thought, swelling with self-pity. Where was Helena? This had all been a lot easier when Sadie was around. Sadie. He shut his eyes. He had been stupid, of course, about how he handled it. But Helena had overreacted, and he had let her, because it was easier than arguing or trying to explain. It had ruined the holiday for him, for all of them, actually. Rosalie crying all night, her little voice hoarse from it. The child was hollow with grief. Ivo and Magnus unable to look him in the eye. Helena rigid with disapproval and rage. And no Sadie. He was surprised by how much he missed her, there and at home. Her smile, her gleaming tanned limbs as she arced into the swimming pool. Her laugh. Her very round, very full breasts, generously displayed in skimpy sundresses. He wasn't stupid enough to ask Helena if she had got around to replacing Sadie yet. That didn't mean he couldn't encourage her to get on with it. Bruce got up and went to the door. When he opened it, Rosalie fell backwards, landing on her elbows. She looked up at him reproachfully. I was leaning on the door. I know. He held out his hand. Give me the story. Her eyes widened, and then she scrabbled for it, so eager he almost laughed. He skimmed through it, murmuring, Oh, very good. And that's a nice phrase, at intervals. Taking in very little of it, but it did seem to be nicely expressed, spelling and handwriting aside. Really, Rosalie, this is excellent. Is it? She hadn't looked away from his face since he started reading, focused on every nuance of his expression. You've excelled yourself. He handed it back to her. Now go and show Mummy. She said she's busy. Bruce smiled. Don't take no for an answer. She'll be so pleased when she finally reads it. Like you. Absolutely like me. He pretended to steal her nose, which he wasn't good at, and she laughed dutifully, and a little too loudly, as she always did. And Bruce closed the study door on her with the comfortable feeling that he had killed two birds with one rather clever stone. He would reward himself, he decided, with a little nap. Helena if she was honest, and Helena always tried to be honest, she had been nervous about the interview. The publication wasn't one of her usual sources of commissions, and that was something she was determined to change, even though, politically, she doubted that she would see eye to eye with the editor 
but of course, that didn't matter. What mattered was the message about adoption. Helena was confident, as ever, that she could win this journalist over, but she didn't expect it to be effortless. I hope you'll be fair, Helena said. I'm always fair. An easy reply. Instant, questionably sincere. He was lean and whippy, with dark hair that flopped over his forehead, and small round glasses, and he wore a white shirt with the sleeves rolled up to reveal a few inches of tan forearm. Muscular intellectual was so strongly Helena's type that she felt slightly weak. I read your profile of that racehorse trainer. He raised his eyebrows, amused. Reading up on me? Of course. Forewarned is forearmed. She refused to be embarrassed about it, even if he was suggesting she should be. He had presumably done his homework on her, too. You gave him a hard time. Not as hard as he gives his horses. He has a job to do. And he does it a certain way. The journalist shrugged. All I did was describe it. I can't help it if it doesn't read well to most ordinary people. I don't want to look like a bitch, Eleanor said, holding his gaze. He laughed, holding his hands up. I promise not to put words in your mouth. And then she thought he was genuinely impressed by the setup in the sitting room, with a tray of biscuits and coffee, and two chairs facing one another, and a table in the middle for his recording device. Because Helena knew a good recording was vital if he was going to be able to write an understanding profile of her. He had looked at the paintings on the walls and admired the secretaire desk that was a wedding present from her mother. She thought they were getting on very well, in fact. So well that she found herself saying more than she usually would about how the current approach to adoption involved social workers sacrificing children's chances because their awful birth families wanted to keep them. So they grew up in squalid, unsuitable conditions and were neglected until they were just as hopeless and drug-addled as their parents. Family is something you should earn, not something that's given to you as a right, just because you're too stupid or careless to avoid getting pregnant. The journalist looked up at that and smiled. He had a crooked mouth, an angular face, nicotine staining on his fingers. Not handsome, Helena had thought, but interesting. I've read your blog. Do you really think that unemployed people should be required to use contraception to qualify for benefits? I think if they had any sense, they would choose to anyway, Eleanor said carefully, thinking, yes, obviously. Not having any proper income or stability should rule out having children. But having a child could be a great motivator for someone to find work and change their circumstances. They should do it beforehand, not afterwards. Nothing is easier once you have a child to take into consideration. Helena leaned forward. I'm not suggesting a baby is a reward for good behaviour. No one should have a family out of indolence or self-interest, that's all. Parenthood is the purest kind of self-sacrifice, an investment with no return except the satisfaction of seeing a human reach their full potential. And what about drug users? Alcoholics? Should they have to use contraception to qualify for medical care? Helena shuddered. The pill seems to be the one drug it's impossible to persuade them to take. And then the babies are so damaged when they're born. Even if they're adopted into a loving home, they can experience great difficulties. So do you think long-term drug abusers and alcoholics should be sterilized? No, and I didn't say that. She shook her head at him, mock severe. 
People should be encouraged to make good decisions. But, as we all know, some of them can't. Or won't. I think it would be better if they didn't have children. But if they do, we can't expect them to take on that responsibility. These are people who can't even take responsibility for themselves. What matters then is the child. Their safety. Their happiness. Their health. I don't see what's controversial about wanting them to be brought up in a loving, caring environment where their emotional and spiritual needs will be met. And you don't think that would happen if either or both parents had a history of drug abuse? In very rare cases, maybe. Very rare. As I say so often, everyone is concerned about the rights of the parents to have children and keep them. Someone has to advocate for the children who have no voice. And that's you. Another warmer smile. He was definitely attractive, Helena decided. She bowed her head. I would rather not. I don't seek the limelight, believe me. But I feel a responsibility to speak up. You've started making quite an income from it too, haven't you? Fees for speaking at conventions in the US, payment for articles, TV and radio appearances, they add up. Helena's face was burning. The glow of mild sexual interest had turned to a different kind of heat. What does that imply? And how do you know about it anyway? Your accounts are filed with company's house. I did a little digging. He handed her a couple of pages, printouts from the internet. I was curious to know what kind of gatherings you were invited to attend. She glanced at them, saw a familiar logo, and had to resist the urge to shut her eyes in horror. Look, I don't see how that's relevant to this interview. I am very professional about spreading this message. Various kinds of people are interested in what I have to say. I don't limit who can buy my book, or read my newspaper articles, or my blog. So why should I pick and choose who gets to hear me speak? Can you go into more detail about what kinds of people you're talking about? Not really. Helena was defiant now. The disaster unstoppable. That organization that booked you to attend their annual convention, that first one I showed you, they present themselves as Christians with a particular commitment to the family. That fits in with your ethos, doesn't it? Helena found herself touching the cross that hung around her neck and took her hand away, irritated that he was getting under her skin. I mean, in part, but just because I speak somewhere, that doesn't mean I agree wholly with the aims and beliefs of the organizers. They're a far-right neo-Nazi interest group with links to the Ku Klux Klan. Did you know that before you went to Florida last year to speak to them about adoption and limiting procreation for what you called undesirable parents? I don't want to talk about this. I can understand that, but I'd love to know how it came about that you went there. I had an email from the organiser. Helena's face felt stiff. I get lots of emails, lots of requests to speak. I turn down many of them. But not this one. No, it was a generous offer. She tried to smile. Too generous in retrospect. They were paying my expenses plus a fee. I, I should have looked into it more closely. But I'm not a politician. I don't have staff. I don't have an organization behind me. It's just me. And I tried to share information that I consider to be important and potentially life-saving. And if the audience wasn't my usual one, they were polite to me and didn't expect me to espouse their, uh, odder beliefs. 
So when did you realize about their, uh, odder beliefs? She sat up straighter, irritated by the mimicry. When I arrived. But you didn't think about pulling out of the convention. I... No. I was a key speaker. She swallowed. They had my picture on the advertising. I didn't feel I could let them down. And I knew what I had to say wasn't hateful. It was an opportunity to reach out to people. I'll talk to anyone. Maybe I helped to moderate their opinions. You never know. They had your picture on the flyers. They also took your picture on stage. The journalist handed her another printout, this time an image from a website. The reproduction was fuzzy, but unfortunately all too recognisable. Helena in full cry, with some dubious, at best, imagery behind her, a stylized tree that was the logo of the organisation, a banner that read R-A-H-O-W-A, and another, with a sentence written down it, red on white, illegible thanks to the way the ink had bled into the paper. Deniable, Eleanor thought, although with her fair-haired beauty, she had an Aryan mother look to her that was at best unlucky in the context of the setting. Do you know what Rahawa means? Helena prized open her lips, which had tightened. I do now, yes. I didn't at the time. What is it? He smiled again. I'll say it, shall I? Racial holy war. That's a very well-known white supremacist concept. And what was on the banner on the left? I... I didn't read it. Hard to miss it, surely. It's a sentence known as the 14 words. I don't know anything about that. It says, We must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children. That didn't make you uncomfortable when you saw it was your backdrop. I was just there to deliver my speech. You're an intelligent woman. You must have known these people were racists and fascists. They were hardly hiding it. As I said, I felt obliged to speak. Helena squirmed. They had arranged my transport. I was depending on them. This place was in the middle of nowhere. A swamp, literally. I had no choice. They forced you? Not exactly. I didn't... I just thought it was best to get it over with, as I'd agreed to do it, and then go. And that's what I did. And took the fee. Helena opened her mouth to reply, and then closed it. There was nothing, literally nothing, she could say to explain why she had kept the money that didn't sound selfish. But she had earned it, talking to those awful people in ridiculous humidity, when she was tired from the flight and the long car journey with a vile, low-grade woman who had not stopped talking for even a minute. And it was a lot of money, and the roof had been leaking in three places, so they had needed it. What would you have done? she said instead. The reply was instant. Donated it to a suitable charity. How do you know I didn't? Did you? It was like tennis, back and forth, back and forth. Helena hesitated, to lie or not to lie. She couldn't prove she had, but he couldn't prove she hadn't. Or maybe he could. She could be vague about which charity, so he couldn't track it down. But he was clearly thorough. He was capable of putting in the hours to prove her wrong. The silence was heavy. Helena met the journalist's eyes, which were warm, inviting her to laugh, inviting her to admit that she'd been wrong, but she would never do it again, she promised. Or maybe he liked her. Maybe he was getting a frisson out of this. A Cary Grant and Catherine Hepburn moment, 
where arguing led to mutual admiration. Helena couldn't read him at all, and for once she didn't know what to do. Flirt? Argue? Deny everything? Cry? All of the options sounded equally awful. For a mad moment, she imagined herself leaning across, putting her hand on his knee. Let's forget about the interview. Let's settle this argument another way. A clatter at the door made her jump, and she exclaimed, irritated. Mummy! The hoarse little voice, the aftermath of tonsillitis that had afflicted Rosalie since they came back from their holidays. It made her sound like a forty-a-day smoker. Not now, darling! It came out high, a sing-song, tinny with insincerity. The journalist tilted his head towards the door. Your daughter? Mummy, Daddy told me to show you my story. The handle of the door started to turn. Not now. What was Bruce thinking? Helena jumped up and yanked the door open. Rosalie was holding a piece of paper with both hands, her expression wary, her body poised for flight. She looked terrified, which annoyed Helena even more. For God's sake, Rosalie, I told you not to bother me. I just wanted to show you. Yes, I know, and it can wait. It's hardly urgent. I'm busy. Helena was shaking. It was a reaction to the stress of the interview more than anger. A bitter whiff made her clamp her arms against her sides. She had sweated through the top she was wearing. So unfair to be interrupted when she was trying to think. So impossible to come up with an explanation for what she had done. Rosalie's eyes filled with tears. I'm sorry, Mummy, but you're always busy. Helena glanced back to see that the journalist had got to his feet, his face concerned. This was intolerable. And it was all Bruce's fault for sending her to find her, and for what he had done with Sadie, so they couldn't have a nanny any more, which was humiliating and enraging too. All of the bitterness and anger seemed to slosh around inside Helena's chest, splashing acid into her throat. Ultimately, and because she was standing in front of Helena, it was Rosalie's fault for not taking no for an answer. Just for a moment, Helena's self-control slipped. Go to your room, she hissed at her daughter, leaning forward. Go on, get out of my sight. I can't speak to you now. When? When can I come out? When I say so and not before. Helena swung the door closed, managing not to slam it, but only just. She stood for a second with her back to the journalist, before she turned to him, a smile pinned to her face. Perhaps he hadn't heard. Where were we? The journalist was looking shaken. That was your daughter. Rosalie, Helena confirmed. She's quite the little attention seeker, I'm afraid. Sometimes she drives me mad. I've completely forgotten what we were talking about. Your adopted daughter. Helena's lip curled. <laughs> what does that have to do with anything? Silence. Time to take control, Helena decided. I'd love to pursue this discussion, but we probably need to wind this conversation up, I'm afraid. As you can see, I'm very busy. I have three children to think about. It just seems ironic, doesn't it? With her being adopted, and you not having any time for her. He was pale with anger, she realized with a rush of fear. Please don't take her word for it. She has a very shaky grasp on reality. Is that so? She made one last attempt to find common ground. Look, do you have kids? 
I don't think that's relevant. We're talking about you. Not anymore. Helena took a step closer to him. Rat-faced little creep. Opinionated pipsqueak. He was so unappealing now that he was looking at her as if she was something he'd stepped in, with his pseudo-intellectual styling. The interview is over. Can we arrange another meeting? I had a few more questions. I'm sure you did. She held the door open for him. You can email me if anything comes up. He fumbled his recorder as he picked it up, swinging his leather satchel onto his shoulder, grabbing for the tweed jacket he'd hung on the back of his chair, flustered and furious. I don't know if I can do a good job, you see. If you don't address the issues, I mean. You might not be very happy with what I write. That's a risk I'll have to take. It didn't matter, Helena thought. The readers of that rag wouldn't be on her side anyway. Do-gooders never actually did good. They didn't do anything. They just patted themselves on the back for being wonderful. Could I go to the toilet before I leave? Pathetic. The lavatory is at the top of the stairs, on the right. Mum? Mum? Ivo hit me! Magnus, shouting for her from the garden. As if this horrible situation could get any worse. Ugh, thanks. Sorry. I won't be long. The journalist scuttled past her. Fine. She wanted to shove him up the stairs. Magnus was capable of saying literally anything about her, as long as it was an insult. Just hurry up. Rosalie. The carpet in Rosalie's room had been thin and worn before she ever came to live with the marshals, and now it was patched with stains from various incidents that Rosalie classed as unimportant. Still, she preferred to lie on the floor instead of sitting upright on the bed. The floor was better. You could arrange your toys around you, and they didn't fall over. And you could write in your notebook as if it was on a table, whereas on the bed it was too soft, or you had to write on your knee, and either way it was annoying. And she wasn't allowed to lie on the bed. Her mother disapproved of it because it rumpled the covers. And she wasn't supposed to be in her room most of the time anyway, which was all right because it wasn't a very nice room. It was small with faded curtains that smelled musty. And there was only room for the bed and a chest of drawers that had a book shoved under one side to keep it from tipping sideways, and a drawer that stuck an inch out and could never be closed properly. The walls were covered in white paper, garlanded with green wreaths, and the curtains were pink, and the carpet had been a strange shade of grey before she had spilled things on it, so none of it had ever really gone together. The wallpaper was old and blotchy, with brown stains, like a fawn's coat, but she liked tracing the garlands of leaves with a finger when she was waiting to feel tired enough to go to sleep. Her bedtime was earlier than she would have liked, but her mother was strict about it. Young girls need their sleep. And it was useless to protest that she wasn't sleeping but lying in the half-light, listening to life going on without her. She wasn't allowed to put posters up, like the boys, and there wasn't room for a bookcase. But there was a shelf where she kept her dolls, and she had five books on it. Ballet shoes, which made her wish she had two sisters instead of brothers, and made her wish she liked ballet lessons, but she did not. Charlotte's Web, which made her love spiders. Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, which was hallowed twice over because Sadie had given it to her, and she had read it and reread it until she knew it more or less off by heart. A book of Bible stories, either terrifying or boring or incomprehensible, with hideous illustrations 
that reminded her of rainy day trudging around the National Gallery. And her book of Greek and Roman mythology, which was the second best thing she'd ever read after Harry Potter. Rosalie flattened out her notebook. She was writing a new story about the Minotaur. Or really, what had happened after the Minotaur, when Theseus had forgotten to change his sails from black to white because he was so excited to go home, and his father had thrown himself off a cliff, maddened by grief, assuming his son was dead. Rosalie tried to imagine her own father throwing himself off a cliff because he was maddened by grief, and could not. But she did know all about one small mistake, made with the best of intentions, followed by disaster. Rosalie put her head down on her arms, squeezing her eyes shut. That was what had happened on holidays with Sadie. But she hadn't known when she took the picture of the swimming pool. She hadn't seen them. It was Magnus who had pointed it out. And then everything had gone wrong. Rosalie? At the sound of the stranger's voice, Rosalie sat up, rubbing her eyes. He was leaning around the door of her room, the dark-haired man who had been talking to her mother. Are you all right? He stepped inside the room and crouched in front of her, setting down his leather bag on the floor. What are you up to, Rosalie? How do you know my name? She asked, instead of answering him. Your mum told me. Are you friends with her? He smiled. Is this your room? It's very nice. Rosalie decided instantly that he was another adult who told lies when it suited them, because there was no world in which her bedroom could be described as very nice. You like reading, do you? Do you like Harry Potter? He's great, isn't he? She nodded, although it wasn't really Harry Potter himself who was great as far as she could see. He was so slow to realise what he could do with his powers, which was frustrating when you knew exactly what you would do if someone came unexpectedly and told you you were actually a wizard. What are you doing? Writing. She put one hand across the page in front of her so he couldn't read it. It's not finished. But you finished another one, didn't you? Because you wanted to show it to your mum. I'd love to read it. He had a soft voice and kind eyes behind his little round glasses. But he smelled funny. A bitter kind of smoky smell that made Rosalie's nose sting. I'm actually a writer myself. It's my job. So I'd be really interested to see it, if you didn't mind showing it to me. She had been sitting on her story, flattening the page under her, and it was warm when she handed it to him. He sat on the edge of her bed and smiled at her before he started reading. It was the first time anyone had read anything of Rosalie's the way she read books, concentrating on every word, line by line. He didn't say anything while he was reading, unlike her dad, and he didn't hand it back to her with a comment about her handwriting after a quick glance, unlike her mother. And Sadie had always sighed and said she didn't know anything about writing, and she was too busy to stop and read something when she had so much to do, and couldn't Rosalie see it was a bad time? But this man was really interested. He read it through, and then read it again, nodding this time. You did a really good job on this, Rosalie. A really good job. I like the way you describe the snakes on her head hissing. And this line about Perseus being braver than handsome. I like that a lot. You're a very good writer. Rosalie felt shy and happy and absolutely unable to say anything in response. 
I bet English is your favourite subject in school. It was always my favourite too. Which school do you go to? What are you doing? Her mother, in the doorway, staring at them. Rosalie, what have you said? Nothing. She hasn't said anything. I it was me. He was standing now, the story crushed in one hand, forgotten. It's not her fault. You shouldn't be in here. You shouldn't be talking to her. This is so inappropriate. I can't even begin to... You know you shouldn't have done this. Get out of her room. Rosalie's mother was shaking with anger, her eyes bright and hot. The man picked up his bag and slid out of the room without speaking to Rosalie, not even goodbye. He had shoved her story into his jacket pocket, but she was afraid to ask for it back. It wasn't her fault. He had found her. He had sat on her bed. He had asked her questions and wanted to read her story. And she had known it was wrong. She had just wanted him to tell her she was special. That she was as different as she felt. That she had power no one knew about. Her mother had shut the door, but they were standing right outside, and Rosalie could hear everything she was saying. The man was completely silent, which was the right course of action, Rosalie had found, when her mother's voice was low and sharp and terrifying, and her words came out so quickly they all ran together. Well, you've made quite the mistake here, haven't you? You obviously came here with an agenda. You want to write a profile of me that implies I'm not a good mother, and I'm a white supremacist, and you're prepared to go and interrogate a child to get evidence against me. She's pathetically trusting. She wouldn't have the first idea why you were talking to her, or that she should be wary of you. You took advantage of her, and you know it was wrong. I was just checking she was okay. She seemed upset. As if it's your place to do that. As if it was appropriate for you to lie so you could make your way up here and find her where there was no adult supervision. I suppose I should be relieved that you were both fully clothed. It wasn't like that. His voice was louder now, angry. No one shouted back at Rosalie's mother. No one except Magnus, and he always regretted it in the end. Here's what's going to happen. If you write anything about me, anything at all, even the most basic and bland profile, I will publicize the fact that you approached a vulnerable child in her bedroom alone and lied to do so, and that you were interrupted before you could do anything else, but that I have grave concerns about how safe you are around young children. You will lose your job and you won't find it easy to get another one. You might be able to damage my reputation, but believe me, you'll regret it when you lose yours entirely. Silence. Rosalie held her breath. Now, when you leave, I'm going to call your editor and explain to them that you were rude and intrusive and behaved inappropriately. I think you'll find this interview simply won't have happened. Helena, get out. Footsteps retreated from the door, moving down the hall and then down the stairs. And the front door banged. And a car engine started just below Rosalie's window. And the car drove away. She went to the window to see it. Small. Red gone. When Rosalie turned back, the door was open again, and her mother was standing there, watching her. Although she couldn't have put it into words, she had a child's instinctive and immediate understanding of what was happening. That her mother was angrier than she had ever been before. That she had not vented enough of that anger on the man to relieve her feelings. 
and that Rosalie had been bad enough to make whatever happened next justifiable. J. Magnus, come on, it's easy. Magnus, hanging upside down over the back of his chair, didn't answer. Magnus, your parents would be really cross with me if I let you skip this. They're paying me to teach you. That's their choice. Magnus straightened up, turned, and plumped down on the seat. His face was glowing red, and his hair was wild. And it's my choice not to bother trying to understand any of this. You have to understand it. You're failing maths, your mum said. Your mum said you were a fucking dork. Shut up. Jay said it too fast, giving away his real feelings. Better to have ignored it, obviously, but he'd reacted. Magnus gave him a slow smile, and he was able to translate what it meant. I know what annoys you now. Look, it's just a simple equation. It's like a puzzle. On one side, you've got the answer, here, 39. And therefore, we know everything on this side adds up to 39, even if some of the numbers are represented with an X. We do know that, but we don't give a fuck. You will when you're back at school and your teacher finds out you didn't learn anything over the summer. Magnus opened his eyes very wide. It's not my fault. I had a shit tutor. I'm not shit. Jay kept his voice level this time. And I'm trying to teach you. But you said yourself, you're choosing not to understand any of it. The twelve-year-old's face contorted with rage. I don't care. What Jay wanted to do was scream back. I don't care either. Throw the mat's paper in the little turd's face and walk out. But he held on to his temper. He needed this job. In a month, he would be packing his little car with everything he needed for university and driving up to Oxford on his own for the first time in his life. It was strictly forbidden to work during term time because the terms were only eight weeks long and he understood that and respected it. He didn't want the distraction from his studying, which he knew would be demanding, but ultimately rewarding. Equally, it was vital for him to have some money, because his fucking stepdad had made it clear to him that he was on his own now that he was 18. Going to Oxford was his chance to reinvent himself, which had started already with the way that he'd told everyone he was to be known as Jay and had grown his hair out so it hung over his eyes and curled on his neck and the new trainers he'd bought at staggering expense with the first money he'd got from tutoring. He wasn't the old version of himself anymore. The wimp who got bullied in school, who was afraid to open his mouth most of the time. Oxford would be different but he'd need money to enjoy it, or he'd end up staying in his room on his own the whole time. Like you do now. No. Intolerable. He had to make this work. Jay leaned back and crossed his ankle over his knee, folding his arms across his chest. It was a smug pose, but he'd earned the right to it. I am going to Oxford, and you, Magnus, are going to get expelled. You think you're never going to understand this, so you're getting angry with me to distract me. It must make you feel really thick that you can't get the hang of it, because it's easy, let me tell you. I'm not thick. I didn't say you were. I'm telling my mum you call me thick. You can if you want, but I didn't. I said, you feel thick because you haven't understood this yet. But you can. Come on, look at it with me. 39. And then, on the other side, 
we have a three outside the bracket and inside the bracket. This is too hard. Magnus was fidgeting, his face still brick red. He was on the verge of tears. It's so simple. Jay stared at the paper in front of him, trying to find a way to explain it. Three by two X plus five equals 39. He could read it like a sentence. As so often, he found himself trying to communicate it to Magnus telepathically. X equals four. X equals four. It would possibly be easier for them to learn telepathy than algebra. What are you doing? Rosalie had wandered into Magnus's room unobserved. She was standing beside them, staring at the page. What's that? Maths, he and Magnus said in unison. And Magnus added, It's too hard for you. You won't understand it. Explain it. She put a finger on the page, pointing. Why are there letters if it's maths? Because it's evil. Magnus sounded sulky and tired. Time for a break. Before the words had fully left Jay's mouth, Magnus had shot to his feet. Can I get a snack? If your mum says it's okay. But you have to come back here in ten minutes. Yep, I will. He slammed out of the room, and Jay listened to him rattling down the stairs. And the silence as he jumped the last few steps on each flight. Ten minutes. That would be half an hour if he was lucky. Magnus didn't wear a watch, and also Jay wasn't totally sure the kid could tell the time. Meanwhile, here was Rosalie, puzzling over a sum that was far too advanced for her. She was wearing a pink cotton skirt and a white T-shirt that was a fraction too short. An inch of skin appeared when she leaned on the desk, one foot propped on the other. Explain it to me. No, I'm bored with this one. Your brother doesn't understand it, but I have to make him understand it. Jay leaned on the desk, looking at Rosalie. She had long eyelashes and a pretty mouth, like an anime character. Why don't I tell you about the question I was asked in my interview for Oxford? She turned to look at him, interested. What's Oxford? A university. I'm going to study there. He took a clean sheet of paper and started drawing on it. Look, I was asked all about rectangles. Do you know what a rectangle is? Yes, I'm nine. <laughs> of course. Sorry. I just, I didn't know. It was happening again, as usual. Why couldn't he ever manage to talk to people? What he meant and what he said seemed to be two completely different things. What about rectangles? Rosalie asked, and he recovered. She was actually interested. Well, the question was, how many rectangles you can fit in a square so that you fill it? And the rectangles have to be a certain shape. The long side has to be twice as long as the short one. But they can be any size as long as they fill the square completely, with no overlapping. She considered it. What if you had a really big square and really tiny rectangles? You'd fit lots in. The point is to work out if there are any numbers of rectangles that you can't fit in. Look. He started drawing the ruler making a silky sound as he swept it over the page. Outside, someone was mowing a lawn, and downstairs there was banging on pipes. And in the garden, Ivo was yelling. But it all receded. There was only him, and the page, and the girl leaning over his elbow, watching, her breathing tickling his skin. So, one rectangle obviously won't fill the shape of a square. That means we can cross off one 
on our list of numbers. He wrote it to one side of the page, with a line through it. But two would? Yes, definitely. Side by side. Or one under the other. He drew a line and showed her how to measure the rectangles. One centimetre by two, in his neat little box. Now the rectangles can be any size as long as they're in the right shape, or what's called proportion. The hard crack of a bat hitting a cricket ball. A magpie scuffling in the gutter by his head. The whisper of his pen on the page, busily drawing, unfolding the explanation. The beauty of it. And he felt all over again the thrill of rightness when he had come up with the solution in his interview, after minutes of silence and panicked staring and trying to concentrate, to think, to remember. Because if you divide the rectangles in two, you get squares. And we know you can divide each of those squares into rectangles again. And our number is going up in threes, because every time we divide one rectangle into four rectangles, we go up three numbers, because four minus one is three, and we've already counted the one. So any number of rectangles we have can go up in threes. He was talking faster, the words spilling out of his mouth, explaining it badly, but striving to get to the point anyway. And then we know multiples of the numbers that work will also work, don't we? And we start seeing that we could go on forever. I know. Like a pattern. It just goes on and on. She pointed at the list of numbers he had been scrawling beside the shapes, so he could tick them off or cross them out. Eight, nine, ten. All of them work. You checked them. And it goes up in threes. So there won't be any gaps after that. And you only need to work it out for the little numbers. No gaps, he repeated. Rosalie, you are seriously clever, sweetheart. Did you know that? I'm bored, Rosalie said, and slid off the chair, pushing her hair off her face with the back of a hand that was none too clean. No, don't go. Stay here for a while. He got to the door before her, just in time to slam it shut and hold it there. She was very small when he was standing up. Tiny. Uh, stay here, little one. There's, uh, there's something else I want to show you. Magnus. He was hungry, and he did want a snack but after he'd eaten it, he had no intention whatsoever of going back up to his bedroom under the eaves, where it was hot and airless, especially because that arsehole J.V. was there. J. <laughs> As if he was ever going to be anything other than J.V. As if J. was a cooler name than J.V. What a twat. He had a rash of acne on his cheekbones and neck, the skin red and inflamed and he smelled weird. A musty odour from his body, overlaid with detergent and deodorant, and whatever he put in his hair that made it look as if it would be hard to the touch. Wax? Gel? Magnus wasn't clear in it, and he certainly wasn't going to ask J fucking V. He kept an eye on the bathroom for the arrival of new products he could try, but so far, Ivo hadn't bothered with anything like that. Ivo kept his hair short. He wasn't interested in changing his image. He didn't need to. Sports boy was a good enough look. Whereas Magnus was nothing. Xbox master, maybe. Which in itself was typical, because he had asked for and wanted a PS2. Coming down the last flight of stairs to the ground floor, Magnus became aware of how much noise he was making. He took exaggerated care to avoid the creaking step three from the bottom, holding his breath as he lay down and slid over the final stairs, sprawling on the tiled floor by the telephone table. 
His mother was talking to someone in the sitting room, and his father's study door was closed. But if the phone rang now, he was fucked. He commando-crawled through the hall to the kitchen, towing the door shut behind him before he addressed himself to the fridge and found nothing. He grabbed a banana from the bowl on the table and sidled out through the back door. In the fresh air, it was possible to shake off everything that had happened that day. Magnus ate the banana and dropped the skin behind a shrub, then set off at a run towards the river. The garden sloped downwards, and he had a route that involved jumping off a small outcrop in the rockery and vaulting over a low wall. Ivo said you couldn't call it parkour, but he was working up to doing a front flip off the rockery instead of just a jump. The trouble was that his front flip wasn't 100% reliable, and there had been a couple of times where he'd under-rotated and face-planted, or missed his landing and tipped backwards. That was okay when he was in the gym at school, or on grass. Painful, winding, but not dangerous. If he front-flipped off the rockery, though, he'd be landing on concrete, with chunks of granite behind him. The potential for serious physical harm was too high even for Magnus. He gave a war cry and settled for jumping higher than ever before as he levered himself off the rocks and flew through the air. Magnus, you dick! He landed awkwardly, his ankle buckling under him and pain spearing up through his calf and knee. He crouched, clutching his leg twisting to see Ivo marching towards him, looking furious. What's your problem? We're practicing here, shithead. You almost got hit by a ball. Why did you have to shout at me like that? My fucking ankle, Ivo. You deserved it. Ivo, ice cold, hands on his hips, looking down his nose at Magnus as usual. Magnus felt the rage begin to bubble up from the pit of his stomach. Fuck you. You don't own this garden. One day I will. Mummy told me she's leaving the house to me. She can't do that. She doesn't want us to sell it. She wants it to stay in the family. That means it has to go to one of us. And she picked me because I'm the oldest. That's... that's not fair. There was nothing Magnus could do about being born second, after all. I think it's sensible. Ivo looked past him, his eyes sweeping over the back of the house with proprietorial pride. So he wasn't aware of Magnus shifting his position, preparing to attack. Under his palm, a rock moved, and his fingers closed around it, without him even consciously deciding to pick it up. Magnus! No! Nathaniel was already running towards them, full tilt. And Ivo made the mistake of looking at him instead of Magnus. He was completely unprepared when his brother reared up and bowled the rock at his head. None of the three of them would ever forget the sound it made as it collided with Ivo's skull. He crumpled to the ground, his mouth open in a scream that was at first silent. For a moment, Magnus stared down at him, petrified by horror. Then he ran, half stumbling, sobbing with dry eyes, until he reached the house where his father was standing at the back door, looking down the garden in bafflement. In broken sentences, Magnus managed to convey that an ambulance was needed, urgently, that it was Ivo who was injured, that Nathaniel was with him but not that he, Magnus, was the one who was ultimately responsible. All right, good lad. As his father swung into action, Magnus felt himself sagging, physically, shock weighing on him like atmospheres of pressure when he'd been learning to scuba dive. He knew he should go back to Ivo, but he slid into the house instead, past his father in the hall on the phone 
and started up the stairs. The house was dark and cool after the glare of the garden. Magnus had his head down, so he didn't see Rosalie crossing the landing until he registered the movement of her bedroom door closing out of the corner of his eye. Sally? It was the nickname he had for her. Are you okay? There was a pause before she answered. Yes. Don't come downstairs, okay? Someone's hurt and it's not nice. Who? Ivo. Another pause. Okay. Magnus was self-absorbed and spoilt and overprivileged to the point of being almost completely unbearable. But he genuinely liked his little sister. And even in the depths of his own misery, he noticed two things. Rosalie had never, in the four years she'd lived with them, not wanted to be at the heart of whatever was going on in the house. And she sounded as if she was upset. He went over to the door and listened. Sally? Are you crying? I'm okay. You sure? Yep. The door remained closed. The white paint uninformative. He touched the handle with a fingertip, but didn't try to turn it. Should I leave you alone? Yes, please. With a shrug, Magnus turned away. He had his own problems, after all. Why had Rosalie been upset? What was going to happen to him if Ivor was really hurt? Could he go to prison? He was so absorbed in his thoughts that he'd genuinely forgotten J.V. would be in his bedroom where he'd left him. He was halfway across the room before he saw the older boy hunched over at the desk, his arm moving in an unmistakable rhythm. What the fuck? What are you doing? It's not... It's not... J.V. had half risen and was trying to button his jeans. Uh, look, please, fuck off. Look, please, I, I was just bored. I was just, don't ever come back. I don't like you, and I don't want you in my room ever again. Magnus's voice had risen to a yell. He watched J.V. spilling pens, shoving papers into his bag, and finally scuttling out of the room with his head down. Magnus climbed onto his bed and pulled the duvet over his head. In the warm, cotton-clean dark, something broke inside him. And quite suddenly, he burst into tears. Nineteen. I stood in the doorway of the meeting room, staring at the piles of paper and lists and stacked boxes that had been my work for the last ten days. Coming or going? Liv asked from behind me. Neither. I'm stuck here for good. She edged past me, carrying a mug. We're making progress. If you say so. Since the trip to see Bill Howlett, I had barely seen daylight. With Liv, I had worked through every single box methodically, cataloguing their contents and creating a single timeline of the events before and after Rosalie's disappearance. It was painstaking work, and frustrating. And I had fallen into doing it through a trap Una Burt had set in a briefing the day after Derwent and I had spoken to the retired superintendent. I'm just wondering, she had said, about the value of one or two officers essentially reinvestigating Rosalie's disappearance when we have an active murder investigation running alongside it that is complex enough to absorb your entire team. Derwent had looked at her quickly, and I knew he heard it as a criticism of how he was handling the case, setting the narrative up for some future reckoning when it had gone wrong. I found myself leaping in. I think we'd be incredibly remiss not to start with Rosalie especially when we have access to all of this material. Yes, it's a time-consuming task, 
But I don't know if anyone has ever gone through everything in one concentrated effort. So it may be that we find details that turn out to be more significant than anyone thought up to now. I can't see how we can lose by putting one or two people on Rosalie. If it turns out we need to borrow more bodies for the main case, we can always put reading the material on hold. Good point, Bert said, with an air of satisfaction. It does seem like a critical aspect of the investigation, if you put it in those terms. And I think because you have such a good understanding of its relevance to the overall investigation, Maeve, you should take charge of it. Derwent made a small movement that might have been a protest. But when Una turned to look at him, his face was completely impassive. I matched it as best I could. And so all the joy that Una got out of us was a nod of agreement each. But it had condemned me to endless days spent leafing through the notes and records that Bruce Marshall had so carefully preserved. I was aware of the real action of the investigation taking place elsewhere, as the forensic reports came in. The bloodied material in the second bedroom had once been a pale pink cushion and would have made an excellent silencer. There hadn't been any usable DNA recovered from the second bedroom. The post-mortems had confirmed the causes of death and that the two victims had been drugged with a chemical mixture that bore some relation to chloroform. And that, apart from some test results that were still to come, was that. Derwent was even more absent than before, a figure in the distance and at briefings, and a voice on the phone checking irritably to see if I had finished with the boxes yet. When I arrived at work, he was already there, and when I left, his jacket still hung on the back of his chair but I rarely spoke to him. So much for working together. From what I saw of him, he looked neither well nor happy, and I had too much time to think about it as I ploughed through witness statements and diaries and photographs and newsprint. Now and then, when I noticed Una Burt pausing to watch me and Liv working together, it was hard not to read smugness into her expression. I dropped a file back into its box and carried it across the room to the wall of boxes we had looked at already. I pushed the box into place at the top of one stack and wiped my hands on the seat of my trousers, regretting it instantly. Did that leave a mark? No one will notice. Someone always notices. From the door, Derwent drawled, Are we dusting your arse for prints, Maeve? The boxes just breathe dirt, as you'd know if you'd spent any time in here over the last week and a half. I twisted to see the damage and swiped at the fabric, irritated. What do you want? I want to see if you've finished this wild goose chase yet. I know you think you're going to find her even though better police than you tried and failed. But can we just accept the trail has gone cold? The chances of solving this mystery are nil, and it's a massive distraction from the actual case. I looked at him, surprised at his tone. It was flat, entirely lacking in his usual mischief. You agreed this was important. I didn't disagree. That's a fine distinction. He was staring at the whiteboard. It contained a list of anyone, no matter how obscure, who had contact with the family that summer. And a timeline we had rewritten a hundred times as new nuggets of information appeared. The list of names was long. Workmen, students, a cleaner, colleagues of Bruce's, friends of the family. Everyone who had been caught up in the hurricane of the original investigation. Derwent folded his arms with a wince, as if his shoulder or back was hurting. He had cut himself shaving, I noticed, which was unlike him. A straight graze just above his collar that had bled into the pristine whiteness of what looked like a new shirt. The folds and creases down the cotton were unmistakable, straight out of the packet. 
Maybe I should go. Liv was edging towards the door. Stay, we said in unison. And she stopped. But she was still poised for flight. Derwent had brought an atmosphere of jangling tension with him when he walked in. And Liv wasn't a fan of confrontations. What if this has nothing to do with the marshals being killed? It's been 16 years since Rosalie disappeared. Why kill them now if it has to do with their missing daughter?